Thank you uh, for joining us here at the, at the Renaissance Bio meeting. It's an update on the epigenetic clock of aging. And we've got three great speakers tonight, which Johnny Adams uh, from the Los Angeles GRG or Gerontology Research Group. He'll be giving uh, some additional background and, and intros of the speakers as we move along. But, uh, but Renaissance is really just a, a group of, of local LA uh, individuals, mostly uh, researchers, scientists, or engineers, and, and physicians that are interested in the biology of aging and in developing uh, diagnostics and therapeutics that, that target fundamental aspects of aging and age-related uh, disease. So you know, we're very interested in, uh, in epigenetics and the epigenetic clock of, of aging as a tool to help you track different interventions and also help uh, interrogate different uh, diseases and how epigenetics uh, contributes uh, to them. And, and I think epigenetics is often, often something that's thought of by most people as, uh, as more amenable to modification or change with therapeutics or diet. Uh, you know, rather than something like uh, your genetics, which requires CRISPR or uh, AAV uh, gene therapy. So it's, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, we're just kind of on, on the cusp of, uh, you know, developing therapies that, that uh, can influence your genetics and epigenetics. So, I, uh, so we look at the epigenetic clock of aging as, as a pretty unique uh, tool. So we're, we're really happy to have uh, some of the pioneers of it here today. So, um, uh, you know, in, in additional, uh, you know, uh, point there, there is a handout that I gave everybody here today. It's uh, kind of an exercise. Renaissance Bio is intended to be a collaborative group. So uh, people are contributing. We're not just here kind of watching a lecture or a seminar and, uh, you know, and then just going to go home and forget about it. We're trying to kind of work together to develop diagnostics and therapeutics and manage clinical trials and, uh, and get data out there, uh, you know, about these therapies. Uh, so, uh, you, know, the, you know, the handout, and, and so in kind of thinking about, uh, you know, what would be a decent uh, exercise to, to work on today, a collaborator of mine from Intervene Immune, Dr. Greg Fay, who's, who's here. Uh, sent me an email from the NIH. Uh, they, they have a, a program called the, uh, the All of Us Study. So that's a million person study that, uh, that they're, tra they're monitoring people over time, kind of a personalized medicine initiative. And so the email kind of uh, was asking, what should we track? You know, which is kind of surprising to me that they have this big bucket of money for an All of Us study and I've done all this branding uh, related to it, but they don't even really know what they're going to study yet, right? So, you know, one thing we think they should study is epigenetics and, and epigenetic aging. And so, uh, you know, and the, uh, you know, one of the directors of it is kind of a tech guy, somebody formerly of Intel. Uh, so I, there's, there's a link related to it. He has a lot of kind of tech jargon about, uh, you know, how to uh, you know, develop different uh, applications. So this is a use case scenario that, that uh, he's trying to develop. Uh, you know, for any given application, and um, so, but the handout just has the like uh, seven or eight different steps that he requires for for each, and uh, and the people that are viewing online, there's a, a Google Slides presentation that we can all look at and uh, and edit in real time, and uh, contribute to uh, to this effort. The the uh, deadline for uh, the submission to the NIH for the All of Us study is February 22nd. So we're gonna be uh, you know, learning uh, a, a bit tonight and then uh, editing and revising that use case and then submitting uh, to them within a few weeks. So please help out, please try to uh, contribute any ideas. And if you uh, have any ideas after the meeting, feel free to shoot me an email and we'll try to incorporate them. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Johnny to give uh, the intros. Hey, Bobby. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, welcome to the update on the epigenetic clock of human aging, and much thanks to, to Bobby and a lot of others for their fine work in making this happen. We are uh, here at UCLA and being webcast uh, around the world. So, for those who are completely new to this, epigenetics involves modification of gene expression without changing 
the underlying DNA sequence. And uh, the importance of this is often not well understood, even by senior scientists active in creating aging interventions in our community. And uh, many recent studies demonstrate the connection between epigenetics, especially DNA methylation, and aging. And better understanding this uh, across disciplines will allow us to better create solutions that will lead to better health and longer life. So all three of our speakers are outstanding experts in their fields. Uh, first up is Keith Boer. Now Keith received his PhD from the University of California, Irvine in 2011, where he conducted research in the field of cancer cell metabolism. <clears throat> he then began work at Zymo Research Corporation, developing methods and assays for the investigation of epigenetics. Along with colleagues, in 2016, he conducted a high-impact study uh, evaluating methods for DNA methylation validation. And he continues to conduct research as service project manager at Zymo, with particular emphasis on epigenetics and the microbiome. And his presentation tonight will focus on Zymo's re research and development towards new advancements and applications of the epigenetic aging clock. Keith? Thank you very much, Johnny. Uh, I'd like to uh, start by uh, thanking the organizers for putting this special event together. And thank you all for being in attendance and also those listening online. So my name is Keith Boer. I am the service projects manager at Zymo Research. So uh, that involves all sorts of you know, epigenetics and microbiomics analysis, as Johnny mentioned. Uh, but uh, one, our newest service, which I'm going to spend most of my talk discussing, is uh, this DNA um, epigenetic aging clock analysis. So we can take samples and assess their true biological age as opposed to a birth or chronological age. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Zymo Research, we've been around for about 25 years. Our headquarters is here in Southern California in Irvine. We started investigating uh, epigenetics in 2001 where we launched a, uh, our first kits to help facilitate bisulfite conversion chemistry processes to do DNA methylation analysis. As the field of epigenetics grew and so did our portfolio of epigenetics research projects, Zymo Research became known as the epigenetics company in 2008. And in 2012, we fully embraced the next generation sequencing revolution that was taking place in the field. And uh, we launched a suite of services focused on epigenetics research analysis. Today, Zymo researchers' services and products are the highest rated and most frequently cited for epigenetics research by the scientific community. Um, and we've taken our years of, uh, of knowledge uh, uh, focused on epigenetics and applied it to cancer research, new clinical diagnostics uh, for the field of epigenetics, and also, of course, aging research is now a very big part of what we do at Zymo. So in addition to the roughly 185 experts, uh, the uh, employees of Zymo worldwide, um, we are also supported by a very uh, well-respected board, scientific advisory board of epigenetics research scientists. So Dr. Peter Jones uh, is a professor at the Van Andel Research Institute, director of research at Van Andel, and he studies uh, a lot of the ways uh, DNA methylation influences cancer and carcinogenesis. Also Dr. Steve Jacobson, so he is a, an expert in plant epigenetics and a distinguished Howard Hughes medical investigator here at UCLA. Dr. Alexander Meissner of Harvard University, who studies the connection between epigenetics development and stem cell biology. And also Di David Sinclair from Harvard University, a world-renowned expert in aging research. And uh, Dr. Frederick Rue, who's a clinician uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, advising us on clinical issues. So for those of you who may not be very familiar with epigenetics, I'd like to give a quick introduction, very short. I know Jim Watson will explain this in more detail. Um, but uh, first, some terminology. So genetics is the study of heredity, and our genome equals, uh, refers to all of an organism's hereditary information. Now, this information is carried in the sequence of DNA letters, uh, which are represented by the chemical bases, uh, which we call A, C, G, and T uh, for short. Uh, based on the arrangement of these sequences of bases, um, 
genes, gene promoters, and gene regulatory regions can be identified. So how is epigenetics involved? So maybe we can take an example. If we can pretend that the letters shown here represent the, uh, the, the DNA sequences in our genomes, what we see is that when looked at in certain ways, we begin to see words um, formed. But when given specific grammar and context, these words carry a very clear meaning. However, these same words and letters, when given different context and different grammar, take on an entirely different meaning. <laughs> So in a similar way, epigenetics can be thought of as the grammar that gives meaning to our genome. So we all, all the cells of our body have the exact same genetic information, but in different contexts, they have different meanings. So whether we have the DNA is expressed as skin cells or gives rise to skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, neuronal cells, epigenetics helps to control this process. And so when translated from the Latin, epigenome means literally above the genome or above epigenetics, so controlling genetics. So the most thoroughly well-studied and abundant DNA mark, is, uh, epigenetic mark, is the methylation of DNA. So this occurs on cytosine residues uh, in DNA. And uh, uh, DNA methylation is often associated with gene silencing or, or, or turning genes off. Uh, interestingly, a new, so this is the chemical structure of these, of these bases. A, new, a novel epigenetic mark recently discovered DNA hydroxymethylation, or 5-HMC for short, is often associated with active sites of active gene expression. So exactly how methylation silences genes or hydroxymethylation activates genes is not very well understood. So this is an active area of epigenetics research, but uh, something that uh, scientists at Zymo are trying to, to look at uh, ourselves. Um, so what we've done, uh, this is original data um, from Zymo. Uh, what we see is that for a given uh, DNA sequence, for fully methylated cytosines in that sequence, it seems to increase the thermo, thermo stability of the DNA double helix. Uh, conversely, the same sequence that's fully hydroxymethylated then has a relaxed uh, or reduced thermo stability. So what this means in plain English is that when you methylate DNA, it sort of compacts the DNA and makes it inaccessible to the molecular protein machinery, thus not allowing genes to be expressed. But unmodified cytosines or hydroxymethylated cytosines uh, relax the DNA and allow the pro protein molecular machinery to get in and turn gene expression on. So it's important to remember that over the course of our lives, DNA doesn't change. So the DNA sequences we are born with, by and large, are what we, the same sequences as we, as we grow old until we die. However, epigenetics does change. So depending on the diet we eat, if we get enough vegetables, we stay away from fried foods, uh, whether we smoke or don't smoke, if we get enough exercise and the right kind of exercise, uh, we try to avoid stress-free lives. All these different environmental factors have direct impact on change and alter our epigenetics. So when you think about it philosophically for a, for a moment, epigenetics really defines a mechanism in which our own personal experiences or life history is directly written into our DNA which is the very fabric of the material that makes us who we are. So how did Zama research get into aging? Well, uh, this is a, as long as societies have existed, uh, people have been sort of fascinated by this question of aging and the aging process. Uh, in uh, Western tradition, uh, uh, aging is often, uh, there's often a, a fascination, obsession with youth and, and how, to, how to prevent the aging process. This can be contrasted with Eastern tradition in which aging is often associated with wisdom and therefore highly valued. But whatever the societal uh, attitudes toward aging, um, worldwide, both East and West are soon facing uh, uh, a problem, societal challenges, as the uh, average age of the population will increase dramatically in the decades to come. And so as shown by this uh, Lewis Cranach masterpiece here um, from Renaissance era Europe, you know, he had this idea that, uh, uh, you know, entitled The Fountain of Youth, the elderly would enter and then they would come out the other side sort of youthful and rejuvenated. So whether or not, uh, you know, a fountain of youth exists, you know, if we could identify something like this, this would go a long way to, to benefit uh, or solving some of these facing societal challenges. So you may think, well, of course, there's no such thing as this exists, and you would be right, However, revolution in the fields of molecular biology and biochemistry in recent decades has shown that healthy lifespan extension is definitely possible. The only caveat being that this is shown in model organisms, of course. So a couple of examples, uh, so there's lots of research in this with yeast, uh, C. elegans, uh, you know, all sorts of different um, organisms. Uh, one very interesting one from my alma mater, uh, UC Irvine, is this uh, Methuselah flies uh, from Michael Rose's lab. 
basically we did is a really simple experiment. So he just took the longest lived flies from each generation, males and females, and mated them to each other. And then he took the offspring from the next generation, took the longest lived, mated those to each other, and on and on for, for many dozens of generations. And what he found was that just by doing this simple experiment, he could get a something like four to five time average lifespan increase for these flies. What's really interesting is not only are these flies long lived, but they're also very healthy, very robust. So they're, they're very active, they fly around a lot. Um, if you uh, introduce them into a population of wild type flies, they quickly uh, dominate the population, take all the food, and, and really uh, just run wild. Um, as the uh, research has advanced, uh, there's now more uh, anti-aging research into higher, more complex uh, mammalian systems. So mice studies are now a very uh, active area of aging research. So a study released by Baker et al. Uh, a couple years ago in 2016 uh, focused on senolytics and showed by m modulating this, uh, they can increase the lifespan, healthy lifespan of mice by almost 30%. So whether or not these studies can be translated into humans, the challenges faced by an aging population are definitely there. Um, so it's known that aging is a major driver of chronic disease. Uh, this is important because this is very expensive for the healthcare system. So it's estimated that something like 70%, 75% of all US, US annual healthcare costs can be attributed to the care of chronic diseases. Um, this is also very deadly. So something like two thirds of all deaths can be attributed to uh, chronic diseases such as cancer, uh, uh, heart disease, diabetes, and neurological disorders, and so on. And I believe this chart uh, from Cancer Research UK perfectly illustrates this point. What we see is that the age of diagnosis of cancer goes up a lot um, uh, as people get older. So it's, it's a little, yeah. I don't have a, I don't have one here. I'm not sure. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and you can imagine a similar plot for um, one showing incidence of uh, neurological, uh, this is better, I think, neurological disorders, um, heart disease, and, and so forth. So with these challenges, so the biotech industry has really sought solutions based on some of the fundamental biology that's been discovered in these model organisms in an effort to try to apply them to anti-aging interventions. Um, so the idea is that they can reduce the rate of aging and help save uh, health care costs and also uh, uh, offer health benefits to an elderly population. Uh, so a recent study estimated that even a modest 2.2 years life extension could translate to something like $7 trillion in health care savings over the next five decades. And uh, so their article was published in Cell Press that featured uh, some of the, uh, it's about three dozen companies that are now, um, biotech companies that are now introducing some of these, these aging interventions. So these include things like just pharmacolog pharmacological targeting, so just administering drugs. So rapamycin and uh, metformin, there's ongoing clinical trials and other similar compounds going on right now. Um, so big data, so Google, uh, its parent, parent company, Alphabet, has invested hundreds of millions of dollars into uh, looking at large data sets and trying to devise certain anti-aging interventions. Also, there's new direct-to-consumer, so if you go on Google and do some search for some of this stuff, you can see websites offering personal epigenetic aging coaches, for example, also uh, vitamin or supplement uh, regimens to try to slow down the aging process. Uh, stem cells, of course, to uh, regenerate uh, uh, older damaged organs. And uh, one that I find very fascinating is this young blood movement. Uh, so it's also known as heterochromatic parabiosis. <clears throat> so uh, the idea is that you can take the blood from a younger individual, say in their late teens, 20s, and transfuse that to someone who's older. And it's thought that there's all sorts of factors in the blood that can have these sort of more youthful effects on an, on an elderly individual. And this was uh, lampooned uh, very famously about a year ago on HBO's hit uh, comedy show, Silicon Valley. Um, so in this scene, we see this sort of Steve Jobs like tech CEO. He's at this very important board meeting and it's interrupted as he's getting his weekly blood transfusion from a younger individual. So whether or not uh, any of these therapies uh, will satisfy Cranick's vision of a fountain of youth uh, is not clear yet, but the uh, science uh, around these th therapies is based on real, uh, uh, rigorous, validated scientific data. And so what we, we need, in addition to these therapies, is a good way to identify the best and most effective 
because the problems facing society are occurring right now, these, these challenges with chronic disease, and they're only going to increase. And so if we had a good way to measure aging, we could identify the best uh, interventions in an ethical and efficient manner. And so what we really need is a way to quantify aging. That way it can be measured. And so we're happy to say, so no surprise, we're all gathered here to talk about the epigenetic aging clock. Um, this was uh, first described by Steve Horvath uh, several years ago. I won't go into the details, so I'll let Steve talk about this in the keynote. But uh, just quickly, um, by analyzing the DNA methylation patterns from thousands of individuals, uh, what he found is 353 uh, key loci associated with aging whose, uh, based on their DNA methylation levels, a biological age can be predicted. And so the idea is that uh, uh, based on these, these different methylation patterns, an individual could have either a healthy or sort of more youthful uh, aging uh, progression or an unhealthy or sort of advanced aging biological age relative to the average or to the normal. And so this concept is uh, illustrated further in this cartoon uh, regression uh, diagram here. So we see an individual uh, from the age of 20 based on the type of lifestyle choices they make over the course of their lifetime, uh, whether they choose to get enough exercise, eat right, get plenty of sleep, they could have either a very uh, youthful um, entry into uh, uh, their senior citizen years, or if they make the, the wrong choices, they could have a more advanced age relative to their, their true birth age or chronological age. So when we saw this paper put out by uh, Horvath, uh, we found it extremely fascinating. So we've been act at Zymo Research actively uh, conducting lot, all sorts of DNA methylation research and analysis. And of course, you know, this question of aging is, I mean, it's, it's immediately you know, something that, that just grabs you. And so we entered into talks. We contacted Dr. Horvath um, through some collaborations and work. We uh, eventually decided to license this technology from UCLA and uh, develop it further for uh, research applications and, and, and commercial applications. So how do we study DNA methylation? So there's really one gold standard way uh, to do this. It's uh, based on this uh, chemical process known as bisulfite conversion. So it's a multi-step process. I won't go into it, but uh, Zymo, we've been making uh, kits and procedures to kind of facilitate this uh, complex chemistry to make it very easy and accessible for the average researcher. And the end product is when you apply bisulfite to a DNA template, you can easily distinguish methylated from unmethylated cytosines just by looking at sequence data. So an example here is if you have a methylated cytosine in the original starting DNA template, uh, you apply bisulfite, it's resistant to this conversion, and so when you look at the sequence data, it still looks like a C. However, unmethylated cytosine, it gets uh, converted to T, um, and so when you, see, when you sequence it, you, it's a very easy to distinguish methylated from unmethylated cytosine based on the presence of either a C or T at that position. So Dr. Horvath's uh, uh, aging panel consisted of uh, you know, hundreds, 353 genes. And um, as he was uh, you know, publishing this research uh, in, to the scientific community, um, Zymo Research, as well as others, had been trying to tackle a technical challenge, which was how to analyze many dozens of genes across many dozens of samples in a low-cost, high-throughput manner. So if you want to look at all of the methylome, you can sequence the entire genome, and you get all the information. But this is very costly. If you want to focus on a few genes, there are ways to do this, too, classical Singer sequencing, but this is low-throughput and very labor-intensive. So we developed a uh, method based on microfluidics um, to try to increase throughput to look at locus-specific DNA methylation. So basically what this does is, uh, what this is, is we can design primers to post bisulfite DNA uh, for any sort of application. It doesn't have to be aging. It could be cancer, um, developmental research, uh, whatever. Um, in parallel, we bisulfite treat samples. We then uh, combine uh, primers with samples in this microfluidics device, and we can process in a single run over 2,300 PCR reactions. We then harvest the samples, uh, prep them for sequencing, uh, generate the sequence data, and perform the analysis. We marketed this as our methyl check um, platform for lo locus-specific or, or targeted <coughs> panel validation. And um, we were approached by a European group who was trying to assess all sorts of different methods to look at this sort of high-throughput locus-specific DNA methylation testing. And uh, they said, would you like to participate? We said, of course. Um, they sent us samples for which they knew the, the DNA methylation quantities and said, 
to, there were about 20 participating labs, we, of which Zymo was one, and said, choose your favorite method, measure the met methylation levels, report them back to us, we'll kind of get a, an assessment of the best performing ones. Uh, so that study was published in 2016. Um, it's a little hard to see, but it actually made the, the cover. It said DNA methylation assays benchmark. Um, so we contributed our method, and what we found, what the authors found, I should say, is that uh, DNA methylation testing, this, this panel validation testing, is now ready for clinical applications. Uh, specifically, they found that absolute DNA methylation quantification, of which bisulfite sequencing is one, uh, are the best methods or the method of choice for these validation studies. Um, and they concluded that uh, uh, with this new technology, um, DNA methylation should be widely useful now for early diagnostics, companion diagnostics, forensics testing, and other applications. So we were very pleased to see this in print, to see our you know, ideas, our thoughts validated by other scientists in peer-reviewed study. Um, but with this, we were doing many dozens of genes in a single uh, uh, reaction, um, or at one run. Uh, but of course, Dr. Horvath's aging panel consisted of hundreds of genes. So we knew that even with this advance, we were not sophisticated enough to make the uh, DNA methylation age testing accessible in a very high throughput cost-effective manner. So we had to go back to the drawing board, come up with a new method, um, and we were eventually able to do so. And so we call this our SWARM technology, and it just stands for Simplified Whole Panel Amplification Reaction Method. So I won't go into very detail about how this works. Uh, we don't have enough time. But just want to say it's bisulfite sequencing based. It's high throughput. It's very flexible, so we can add or remove uh, targets from the panel as the science evolves, and it's low cost, making it accessible to, to, to researchers. So I don't talk about the method, but I just want to show some example data. So shown in the panel of each um, uh, figure on this slide, um, we measured the DNA methylation levels at these uh, 353 highly informative gene loci for aging that, that Horvath described. And we cross-validated our bisulfite sequencing swarm technology with array technology. So this older array technology, was this was the type of data for which Horvath based um, his, his original studies. And what we see is that the, uh, the two different technology platforms, they, they're very much in agreement. So it's, it's near perfect correlation. Um, oh, furthermore, we found that by switching to a more precise bisulfite sequence based uh, uh, technology platform, we were able to reduce. Uh, so the original, you know, if you're studying this with array data, uh, Dr. Horvath published that the uh, median error of the test was 3.6 years. But with a more precise technology, we can reduce that further to less than two years. So the platform is very robust. So here I just show technical replicates. So there's near por perfect correlation of these methylation values measured for technical replicates. So with that, plus some additional validation, uh, we found that we had a robust, a robust platform to uh, measure DNA methylation age. Uh, it was highly reproducible. Uh, Access, uh, 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 amen amenable with uh, very low input DNA methylation levels. So we've gone as low as 50 nanograms for certain applications. It's very accurate. It's flexible. As I said, we can add or remove um, uh, targets from the panel as the science evolves. Uh, very versatile, so it can be applied to different um, tissue types. And it's affordable because we're doing high throughput sequencing. <clears throat> so we, uh, mark, we brand this as a DNA age, and so we're, we're offering this now commercially mm -hmm. and with our research partners. Uh, and we were so excited about it that we decided to make it an emphasis and put it on the cover of our, of our current uh, product catalog, company product catalog. So we currently offer this test for age, DNA age analysis of blood samples and also for urine samples. Um, we're working on developing this for other tissue types as well. So uh, currently, um, uh, testing for saliva is something we are we're close to, to to finalizing and being able to offer um, other tissue types possible skin and so on when we look deeper into the data we start to see some interesting patterns emerge so one thing we found that was really uh, kind of fun is that we found that men will age faster than women um, so I don't think this really comes as a surprise to anyone in this audience or listening online um, for centuries and for society, societies across the world, uh, we know that women have a longer lifespan than men. So it's very uh, interesting to see this reflected in the DNA methylation information too, also. Uh, specifically, um, when we dig deeper into that data, we find that the uh, age acceleration seems to occur from about the, about the age of 50, 55 years old. So surely there's uh, some deeper meaning there. 
but what we begin to see emerging is this connection between health outcomes and uh, environmental influences and aging. So what we've shown here uh, in this graph, uh, we looked at the uh, DNA methylation age profiles of individuals uh, known to be either positive for HIV or Down syndrome. So two conditions which um, alter or shorten uh, an individual's lifespan on average. And what we see is that for all these individuals, they have a more advanced or accelerated aging profile compared to the population average shown here in, in, in blue, or a healthy average. Conversely, uh, if we look at the same uh, DNA methylation patterns in the children of centenarians, so people who live to at least the age of 100, and we look at the DNA methylation levels of their children, we see that they have a more youthful or slower aging profile compared to the population average. Um, this is uh, you know, very interesting, especially in, in, in context of these uh, Methuselah flies, these long-lived flies, um, which I mentioned earlier in, in, in the presentation. So with this test, we now have a way to connect uh, health outcomes with uh, the aging process. So for a long time, there's been all sorts of studies showing that different environmental or, or adverse health conditions alter DNA methylation patterns. So <clears throat> obese people have different methylation patterns compared to non-obese. Uh, similarly, people that start up these um, focused exercise interventions have altered DNA methylation patterns in not only skeletal muscle, but also adipose tissue. Um, people that smoke, there's uh, D DNA methylation biomarkers for, for, for um, uh, avid smokers. Um, uh, encouragingly, people who uh, quit smoking, uh, we see that their DNA methylation patterns can reverse. Um, and this is also, this is also uh, seen in, uh, we did a study with uh, the U.S. Army looking at uh, veterans um, coming after their, their tours of duty who have altered DNA methylation patterns um, that are associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. So with this DNH test and this, this epigenetic aging clock, we now have a way to connect all these different health outcomes with the aging process. So this is something we're very excited about and uh, you know, the research is, 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 is just uh, is, is growing. This, data? Did you just test a bunch of people? Uh, this is from publicly available data, uh, data sets, um, so on the, uh, on the chart here. And I think also, the, I think the healthy comes from our internal database. Okay, so I just wanna close with one case study. So a particular application of the aging clock uh, not related to health, but actually for forensic science. So it's just a few slides. Um, so we were actually approached by police detectives uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, Germany specifically, and they were studying a case. Uh, they found a, someone, a suspect of interest in a, a criminal case um, whose fingerprints showed up in an international database of pirates. Um, so they immediately brought in the and notified the organized crime police of Germany, and uh, they became very interested in this and they wanted to, of course, prosecute or apply the law to this, this individual, this suspect. However, um, the age of the suspect was in doubt. So this person is younger, and in, like in Germany or Europe, uh, there's different laws that can be applied to people who can be considered as minors or youth versus people who we treat as adults. So the uh, detectives believe this person to be an adult and to they want to treat the law to the, the fullest extent. But the person said, no, no, I'm a minor. You, you, know, you have to kid gloves here. So they turned to us, oh, because this person was a, a migrant or refugee, uh, so there's millions entering Europe now, I, we see on the news all the time. So this is one person from this migratory flow. Uh, reliable birth records for this individual did not exist. So they needed some way to assess the age of this suspect and therefore they can apply the, apply the law. So they asked us for help. We said, yeah, yeah, of course we'd love to. This is fascinating. Uh, send us the blood of the suspect um, a blood sample from the suspect, and also send us you know, some control individuals. Don't tell us who's who. Let us measure um, using our DNA clock. We'll report the data to you, and then you can unblind us, and we can, we can see what the results show. So they gave us six samples in total, one for the suspect and five sort of control subjects of similar age. Um, so the data is shown here, but I think it's easier to visualize on this bar graphs. So the orange uh, bar graph in each um, uh, from each subject is their, their birth age or their chronological age. And then the blue uh, rec uh, bars represent our measured DNA methylation age. And then the error bars on each graph um, show the 95% uh, confidence interval from our measurements. 
What we see for each of the five control subjects here is that the uh, DNA methylation age is uh, within the uh, estimated confidence interval of the test. So this is sort of an agreement. However, when we looked at the suspect in this case, what we found is that our measured DNA methylation age uh, showed him to be older than his claimed or supposed age. So it uh, supported the uh, uh, ideas of, the, of detectives. It supported their criminal case. And uh, you know, they're very excited about this. And they said, you know, this is nice, but uh, you know, we really want to submit this into the criminal proceedings. I think we need to, we need to be more confident. So uh, we suggested that uh, they let us do uh, repeated measurements of the subject's blood DNA samples. So we get a very precise measurement, and you know, hopefully this can, can satisfy them. So we took six independent uh, DNA measurements of this uh, suspect's blood uh, sample. And what we found is that uh, we could now calculate a very tight confidence interval um, about approximately 27 years of age. So we, we estimate his biological age to be about 27. So this is, you know, you, you don't need to run a statistical test. I mean, we did, and uh, it is extremely unlikely that this person uh, is as young as he claimed to be. So we're very confident about the DNA methylation age or the biological age here, but we needed to take this one step further and associate that biological age to a true chrono chronological age. So what we did was we analyzed uh, subjects in our database. So we looked at males uh, in the age range of this individual, so from 18 to 35, and we assessed their difference in their chronological age from their measured DNA methylation age, or DNA age. So we get a delta age here. And what we find is that the vast majority of subjects in this age group were within about two years of their birth age. And for no individual that we measured was anybody greater, showed a greater difference than seven years. So based on this, um, you know, we thought it's very unlikely that this person is young as they claim to be. Uh, we created a formal report for this. I went to Germany a few months ago. I met with the detectives there, sort of presented this, this study. Um, I signed the document. They administered it to the um, Office of Foreign Affairs. It's now in the public record. And I just got an email yesterday um, in which the scientist, the forensic scientist leading this, this uh, project said it's starting to make a lot of noise. Uh, some uh, news agency picked this up. And uh, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of questions. You know, there's a lot of forensic scientists very interested in this. OK, so just to close, uh, I just want to mention that we, have, we, are, we do offer this DNH test to research um, uh, groups. So we have a clock, of course, for humans, but also now for mice as well. And uh, for any consumers that are interested in testing their own uh, either blood or urine, they can go to www.mydnh.com and order a urine or blood sample collection kit. And uh, just uh, we'll send you the kit. You send us the sample back. We'll do the analysis and give you a report. Um, we have specials in the back. We have a booth set up. Um, there's a conference special, so you can take a coupon. If you're interested, you want to test for yourself, maybe just for fun, there's like a big discount associated with it. So uh, anyone after the talk, please feel free. OK, so once again, thank you for your attention. And uh, if there's any questions now, yeah. So we uh, have time for a few questions, I think. Just ask this question about the migrants. You had a very stressful life when you appear to be older could be. Yeah, that could be. So that's why we uh, wanted to look at the, um, you know, as large of a sample cohort to see if there's, is it common or how likely is it that such a, even if they live this very stressful life, could impact their... Because they tend to affect younger people. Yes. Have you Just been to finding that? The psychological stress has really a very minute effect mm -hmm. that, that would be right. Especially when you're younger. Yeah, just trying to repeat the question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you see an effect in 70 year old who has 40 years of stress. Mm -hmm. That's where you see the effect. Mm -hmm. These short term stresses with mm -hmm. So, sorry. So, for those uh, listening online, the question was if the, uh, uh, the stre if this, this suspect in this case um, lived a, uh, a very stressful life, would it impact their DNA methylation and sort of skew the results of the test? Um, and uh, Dr. Horvath kindly uh, offered that uh, psychological stress probably doesn't have a large impact on uh, DNA methylation age. One question was uh, from uh, online was just what is the cost of this? And somebody uh, asked what's the cost compared to uh, uh, current DNA methylation, uh, you know, other methods. And somebody else also asked, 
can they receive the coupon online also? <laughs> Uh, if they, if you have their uh, email information, I, I think that's we could work something out. We can get in contact with them somehow. So if they can send that to you, um, I can certainly get hold of it. The cost is two hundred ninety nine dollars. So that includes uh, the kit, the collection kit, whether blood or urine. Um, they just send it back to us. We do all the laboratory sample handling, generate the data, perform the analysis, and return the report. Um, so the cost for the entire service alone is cheaper than if you were buying a, an array, for example, and that wouldn't come with any of the sample processing or analysis or DNA isolation. Um, I don't not believe there's any other commercial entities offering uh, DNA, DNA methylation age testing, so I, I believe we're the only one. Uh, there's a question, I think, over here first. I just recently heard that uh, they also test uh, just protein-based test for methylation rather than gene. Is that, does it make sense? Have you, do you know about that? Well, they proteins... Protein, protein levels to detect, to uh, assess methylation. Yeah, but pro proteins certainly get methylated. Um, a lot of proteins do. This, so the question was, a pro, a protein, does protein methylation... Well, they, are there, any tests? are there any tests for protein methylation associated with aging? So none that I'm aware of. Um, there are protein tests for aging, but uh, I think it's different than this, this sort of methylation modification that we're talking about. Uh, I think there was a question here first. Yeah, sorry. It's great talk. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is really, if I understood you, you have a very tight correlation, a straight line, very sexy, uh, and, and you can actually predict someone's age based on their methylation based on these 371 loci. Is that my understanding? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. So my, my question would be, you're saying this is true throughout the body, all tissue types. We uh, can't say that. We can't say that necessarily. Uh, so for so this was uh, developed for blood, uh, blood, blood, oh, blood okay. and we're working on other tissue types. So the epigenetic, these DNA methylation marks will be very different right. in different tissue types. I mean, we know this. And I guess the question I'm really driving at stem cell origin, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, do old men, and that's where I thought you were going, do men over 100, when they have a baby, how methylated are their kids? Because I come from the telomere mm -hmm. measuring space, and mm -hmm. I can tell you that there's no predictive value. The plus or minus two confidence intervals is everyone. So what you have is a real tight correlation, and, mm -hmm. you know, correlation both ways. What, what, at what point, does the epigenetics get reset? If an old woman or an old man has a baby, where do they start their methylation? Path? So this is this is really interesting. So this is a very active area of um, of biology. So um, the DNA methylation patterns seem to get reset during um, a zygotic formation, <coughs> and uh, as uh, cells divide, um, you go from the uh, you know, eight blastocyst stage to the morula stage, and so on, gastrulation. Um, DNA methylation patterns will change to push lineage specificity to, you know, muscle or neuronal lineages. Um, so how these dynamics uh, uh, relate to the the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the parental donor, um, we know they get reset, but somehow there's some memory that also goes with it. And uh, I mean, how this occurs is is a very active area of research. So please. Uh, with, okay, on the on the slide with the the, uh, uh, the, the data, um, when, when you were talking about the, the, the last slide with data, the, the one with the uh, 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 oh no, okay, I meant I meant the um, sorry, the, the um, that one, yeah, okay, so um, it it looks like would you say that there's another line? Implicit there, uh, 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 Down syndrome, HIV negative, and when <coughs> the subject acquires HIV, they suddenly jump to another one of those lines, or is that? Um, yeah. So the 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 point I'm trying to I don't know if the colors are a little little off here, but um, or are difficult to see, but uh, um, the idea is you can connect um, these uh, environmental um, insults um, with a altered aging uh, program. So 
we know that, uh, I mean, you can imagine a similar one for cancer patients, people undergoing, whether it's the chemo or the cancer itself, <clears throat> um, also having this accelerated age. So it's, it's uh, you know, the stress of being infected with this, uh, you know, very serious virus or uh, having a genetic abnormality um, on the body, which uh, alters the aging process and either accelerates it, or if you have, you know, very good genes or you, you know, very yeah. careful with your lifestyle, you can have a... And, and those, those subjects... Well, first of all, it looks like there's a much wider range for, for those of the HIV positive Down syndrome mm -hmm. than there is for the, the uh, other two groups. Is that? Oh, could be. Uh, yeah. So probably the population average is going to be the tightest, but the others. I mean, the sample size is smaller, so there's going to be more um, variation. But the line should be that should be the uh, the average uh, value for that that group shown on the plot. So we can see that they they are different. Okay, because some, some of them look like, um, some of them are well below the line and look like you would estimate their age as in, in the normal population to be rather young. Yeah, that's, so yeah, that's correct. Quite a bit yeah. younger than they actually Yeah, are. yeah, it's, it's very, uh, very interesting, yeah. Okay. Uh, please, in the back. You, sh you showed that you've got the accuracy of the, the chronology, chronological clock now down to less than years, mm -hmm. but I guess what I always struggle with a bit here is the more accurate you make it as a chronological clock, mm -hmm. I mean, imagine you had an absolutely perfect chronological clock, right. there would be no biological information in that. Right, so there's a... So, so, yeah. so are, you, are you aiming to get a, a perfect chronological clock for the sake of forensics, or do you want a clock that has biological information in it so you can tell things about biological age, predisposition to disease and mortality, et cetera. What, what are you aiming for? Yeah, that's a very astute question. So both, right? I mean, that would be until we... Um, yeah, in the, clocks, there would be two different clocks. It would be two different clocks. You're absolutely correct. So, um, you know, when we started working with this forensic case, we were using the, you know, the, the, the original biological clock. And, uh, it, you know, it seems to work very well. But uh, if we could have a really a chronological clock, then uh, like the question earlier, we wouldn't have to worry about this, you know, stress. Maybe they had a physical stress life as opposed to psychological, and that would impact uh, for some reason. But if we had that chronolo that true chronological clock, then for forensics, I mean, this would be the ideal clock. And then for other biological questions, we would have the, you know, the, the original Horvath clock, the aging clock. Uh, in the very back, I think. Yeah, so the question is whether we're looking at um, genes that should be methylated becoming unmethylated and how these patterns change. Yeah. So I think the short answer is all that. So they should have a sort of normal aging uh, or healthy methylation profile. And as we age and, you know, we become infected with HIV or uh, oh. diagnosed with cancer, I mean, these, yeah. these are going to somehow they change it as a result. And uh, they're definitely influenced. So um, I think I'm going to do one more or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, as a commercial product, uh, you can offer a service and they can buy it and they can get a result. Uh, but what we haven't seen in the uh, forensic case that you gave is the range of the data. So, you showed that you can make the errors tighter by making one more sample, uh, reading one more sample. But for any random sample, what's the mean error? So the median error for our clock is 1.9 years. Um, yeah. So for for any one sample, it should be something something in there. Uh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, that's that would be the median error. So if we take the the average difference in uh, chronological age from the uh, uh, methylation age, it's a 1.9 years. Right. And you measure that one person biological age a hundred times. What's the oh. biggest difference that you'll see within that hundred samples of the age? Well, I you know, looking at the the data slide, it should be normally distributed and most of the uh, differences should uh, fall within two years. Um, about that and you'll get the standard deviation, you know, differences set up in a you know 
normally distributed way. So one of the questions we had online was um, <coughs> about what cells are tested in the urine and blood test, and what is the overall agreement between <coughs> those two tests? Oh uh, yeah, so it's a different clock for. The answer is it's a different clock for blood and urine um, DNA. Uh, so we're just I isolating uh, whole DNA from either the urine sample or, or from, from blood, <clears throat> and then uh, applying the bisulfite directly and then uh, looking at those, those panel of genes. So, is, Are you aware of any data uh, with the correlation of the methylation clock to T-Rex, like a recent thymic immigrant oh. cells? And oh, um, we are looking at uh, leukocyte, different leukocyte populations. Um, uh, that data, we're, we're working on that. That data is being developed right now. So I don't have a solid answer for that yet. But active research. Yeah, at the what moment. about correlation with telomere length or telomerase activity? Uh, we looked at that some. Um, there seems to be a big difference with the telomeres in our, um, our own analysis and collaborators that we've uh, looked at the same sample. There, there just seems to be a pretty big error with telomere. Uh, so the precision is... Basically, there's no relationship, or very little relationship between telomere length and methylation age. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Vince? In cases with telomere lengths, we know that in some cases uh, with aging, a certain segment of the population will actually get younger instead of getting older. That is, will get uh, longer telomeres over a five or a ten year period. Do we have any comparable data with regard to methylation as to whether the clock ever goes backwards? We have or some. It does not. Pardon? It does not go backwards. It does not go backwards. Thank you. So, may I ask, in the urine samples, what cells are being? Uh, whatever cells would be shed into the uh, into the bladder. Yeah, it's just it's just uh, isolating whole DNA from urine. So. Find that chart depressing. Because the best case is for the offspring of centenarians. In one case, there's a chronological age of 80 and they're 65. But all the other research is thinking it's the best 10 year difference for the offspring of centenarians, which I presume is the best case. Yeah, it could be. Uh, well, I mean, we'll, we'll see. 20, 30 years younger. sad. I suppose. But, you know, if we can, if we can understand what makes these centenarians so young. Uh, if, we, if we can understand, the, looking at these centenarians, they can give us clues to, you know, what's going on, what the biology is. And it's kind of consistent with the uh, experience. Yes, it's true. But I think we've got one last question. One last question. And then we'll, then we'll move on. Thanks. Uh, so with respect to this uh, question, the offspring of super centenarians have about half the rate of cardiovascular disease uh, that you see in the normal population. And so uh, two questions. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I believe this is from whole blood. Uh, so the question was, uh, yeah, if, if tissue specific. So if we look at, so uh, supercentenarians have uh, reduced rates of cardiovascular disease. So one is, what if you looked at the uh, DNA methylation age of cardiac cardiomyocytes in these subjects, um, and also the first part of the question. Yeah. So in other words, uh, oh, where did these samples come from? Yeah. So. So these individuals are younger <laughs> epigenetically. <laughs> um, I think of the former, yeah, exactly. But Steve, I know that you've said in the past that the different clots or different tissues all seem to give you the same result. So this may be a case in which they don't. Yeah. Um, 
one tissue can be very different from another. In other mm -hmm. words, it could be that a person has young blood, but always kidney or yeah. always lung. Okay. It's just a very relatively little problem. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. You. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. That was outstanding. <laughs> okay, James P. Watson is a physician and top expert on epigenetics and aging. Uh, he also posts detailed scientific information on a wide range of topics at the Anti-Aging Firewalls blog, along with our friend Vince Giuliano. And uh, he'll discuss many important aspects of DNA methylation and epigenetics. Uh, here's Jim. Okay, I don't know if I can plug that one in. So you, you're going to just go ahead and run it. Bobby, you'll just have to run the slides from there. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. No, let's just see. Does this one work? Oh, this one. Do you mind if I get you back here? Okay. The show. There you go. Okay. Um, thank you very much for um, joining us here. For those that are here in person and those that are here with us online, uh, I see a lot of familiar faces here in the crowd. And um, uh, some of what I've uh, presented here, some of you have heard before, but some of it is brand new, and I think you'll be very excited. Um, I first should qualify, I am not an expert on epigenetics. That was a, a completely false introduction that Johnny gave me. <laughs> Rather, I'm a plastic surgeon, and I can make you look a lot younger, but it will do absolutely nothing to your DNA methylation age. But we'll still shamelessly promote facelifts and many other things that have no usefulness in making you truly younger. So I guess the reason I got interested in this is people come in to see me in the office and, and they typically say, Dr. Watson, which cream should I buy to make my face younger? And uh, for many years I'd say, well listen, I'm sorry to say this, but none of those creams work. And I, I of course lost patients and they were angry with me and so, you know, finally I started just asking the question, what, what really is aging about? And I got very interested in the subject, and that's when I met a friend of mine who's here with us today, Vince Giuliano, uh, in the third row back here. And I really want to thank Vince for a lot of information I'm going to present to you. And we're going to shamelessly promote our website here, too, uh, so that if you want to read more about it. So, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, if, if I had, after listening to all your questions, if I had to change my, uh, my title here, I think what I would put is a biological and clinical significance of locus-specific DNA methylation age. And that's very important. And I'm going to bring that up over and over because what you need to remember is your DNA has over 3 billion base pairs. And only about 21 to 22 million of those are actually CPG sites. Is that right, Larry? From what I was saying, about 21.5, somewhere in there, plus or minus a few million. And, and only around a third of those are methylated. Isn't that right, Steve, normally? So, and the other thing I want to remind all of you, and this is really a very important point, when, when the oocyte is fertilized and, and becomes a fertilized egg, guess how many methylation sites are methylated? Anybody want to know? Except the people who really know. Zero. And to me, this is the most amazing miracle in in, in nature, and that is that when a baby is born, he's always zero years old. And I want you to think about how profound that is. So let's take a 80-year-old dad, 
and the mom, let's say, he, he, he robbed a cradle, he married a 25-year-old, okay? So you would think, if you're you know, doing simple math, that the kid should be somewhere between 80 years old and 25 years old, right? If you're thinking the model that you asked in your question. But that's not how it works. It doesn't really matter how old the dad or the mom is. That the DNA methylation age and the age on their birth certificate is always zero years old. And what Steve showed is that if you do in utero DNA methylation, their age is less than one years old. So that tells you how accurate of a clock this is. So, um, you know, we've looked at many other things as clocks. Telomeres are about less than half as accurate as, as DNA methylation for measuring Asian. Um, me measures of cellular senescence are no better. H2AX, uh, beta-galactosidase, P16, INC4A expression. So right now, unless something better comes along, this is the best objective test we have. But it has to be locus specific. If you can wait until the lecture is done, there are four slides on that. So please, the questions are at the end, not in the middle, okay? Um, so for more information on this subject, here's a couple references that are really easy to understand. I really like these. But if you want to go to the best reference by far, it's our reference. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the shameless plugging. This is a website that Vince started many years ago. And I sort of hitched on to his wagon and started helping him write this. And uh, this particular uh, one shows the, the web, the blog we did on methylation. And it was um, posted on September of 2016. And here's the subjects that it goes over. And we, we just don't have time to go through all this. It talks about epigenetics in general, DNA methylation, demethylation, uh, the five different telomere clocks. Dr. Horvath is only one of the the five clocks that have been invented. And you can make a clock too if you want to learn how to do elastic net regression. Uh, it goes over comparing telomere link testing versus DNA methylation clocks in terms of accuracy. It goes over how Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome is an example of accelerated epigenetic aging. It goes over Werner syndrome and, and the difference between Werner syndrome and normal epigenetic aging. It goes over DNA methylation in normal healthy aging without disease. It goes over the difference between epigenetic drift and epigenetic aging, which are different. It goes over the loss of inactivation, which is a, a, an epigenetic problem that occurs with aging. It goes over the loss of repetitive DNA silencing, which is an epigenetic problem with aging. And then it goes over some really weird stuff that, re that Vince and I get very excited about. And if any of you want to talk about this afterwards, I'm happy to answer questions, but I never get questions on these. And that is the link between polycomb protein uh, repressor complexes and DNA methylation age, the link between inflammation and DNA methylation age, the, the, the link between chronic stress. And I want to qualify, okay, we're talking about oxidative stress here, cellular stress. We're not talking about emotional or psychological stress. And then, probably the most important thing is IL-6, uh, a cytokine that we know uh, correlates very well with the phenotype of aging, uh, seems to drive CPG hypermethylation. And then cortisol, based on circadian cycles, not chronic stress, seems to also be a driver of DNA methylation. So we know that cortisol levels cycle every time the sun comes up and goes down. So one reason why DNA methylation clocks may be so accurate is it all depends on how many times the sun's come up and down during your lifetime. <laughs> and you're not going to change the rate at which how many times the sun goes up and down every year. So that's why if, if a lot of this has to do with circadian cycles, you're not going to change how many times the sun comes up every, every year. And that's, in my opinion, one very important reason why this is measuring is a true measure of, of aging and tells uh, a forensic scientist how many times the sun has come up in that person's lifetime. So we don't have time to go through all that. So I'm going to basically stick to these seven questions now. Instead of reading them all out, let's go right into it. So what is DNA methylation? Well, on your far left, there's a chromosome. And if you unravel it like a spool, you'll see there's tiny little spools inside the big uh, chromosome. And those little spools 
are called nucleosomes. And each one of those nucleosomes has 2.7 winds uh, of DNA around it. And along that DNA are cytosine residues. And the spool itself is made of eight proteins that are all clumped together as a little ball. Now, you remember, sir, you asked about could you measure methylation in proteins. The place you might have heard about that was this structure right here. Nucleosomes have tails, and specifically uh, several of these proteins, the most important ones is histone 3 and 4, have tails, and these tails get modified. The most common modifications are shown in this picture, phosphorylation, acetylation, and see the third one, methylation. So histones are proteins, and they get methylated, and that is part of epigenetics. So if you hear somebody saying, I'm measuring methylation of proteins, most likely they're referring to histone protein methylation. But DNA is not a protein, so we know if you're talking about DNA methylation, it, you cannot directly measure it. Now, is there a link between histones and DNA? Absolutely. It's just like the link between thread and the spool. And that's how DNA is compacted. So if you want to say in real simple terms, what is epigenetics? It's really four things, okay? It's gene regulation by histone protein modifications, not just methylation, but acetylation, phosphorylation, sumoylation, uh, ubiquitination, phos and many other alterations to the tails of these histone spools. Uh, the second component of epigenetics is DNA methylation, and now we know it's not just methylation, it's also DNA demethylation, and that actively happens, not just with aging, but with memory formation in the brain. So DNA demethylation is not just an, a phenomenon of aging, it's a phenomenon of normal cellular function. The third component of epigenetics we're not going to really spend any time on tonight, and that's microRNA. And there's thousands of, of different microRNAs we know. And the fourth one is one that most people don't talk about much, but it's chromatin compaction. And that's probably the biggest reason why these DNA methylation sites are important, because they may not just be binding sites for methyl binding proteins, which we'll get into, but they may actually be very important for nucleosome binding. So in other words, it may be that the reason why the DNA winds around the spools is that certain DNA bases, specifically the cytosines, are methylated, and that, of course, uh, facilitates chromatin compaction, uh, which, of course, silences that DNA. So how does DNA methylation silence genes? Okay. Well, the simplest diagram up here is a cytosine DNA base, and you can see there's an arrow, which usually means an enzyme, right, a reaction, and then the methyl cytosine. If you notice, they always put the number five in front of it, and that's because it's always the five prime site on the cytosine that gets methylated. The enzyme that does that are called DNA methyl transferases. We're going to briefly talk about those. And the substrate, the methyl donor, is called S adenosyl methionine, or the abbreviation for that is SAM. Some of you have probably seen SAM for sale in uh, vitamin stores. It's often referred to as SAM or ESAM. It's been a big, um, you know, popular supplement people take for depression. Um, some people say it works. There's not real strong evidence in, in clinical trials, but the bottom line is that's a methyl donor. So if you take a SAM or ESAM supplement, you're taking a methyl donor. Now, the methyl donor gets consumed, though, and the byproduct of DNA methylation is another a uh, small molecule called S adenosyl homocysteine. And this is extremely important. If you don't remember anything else in this lecture, remember that S adenosyl homocysteine is probably the boogeyman, not homocysteine, in a lot of the age-related phenotypes, and we'll get into that more later, okay? So now, how do we put this together? On your left is, ex uh, is a stylized diagram of a gene and the little right angle arrow there shows that that gene is being actively transcribed. Now, if you notice, there's a little symbol here, looks like a mushroom, for TF. That's an abbreviation for transcription factor. So as most of you know, transcription factor is a protein that usually migrates from the cytoplasm into the nucleus and then turns on a gene. But if that site is methylated, now the transcription factor cannot bind to it. 
Why can't it bind to it? Because when there's a methyl group, a protein comes along called a methyl binding protein that attaches at that methyl site. So really the methyl binding protein blocks the transcription factor from binding to the DNA. So as a result, there's no DNA uh, copying, no transcription that occurs. So now you know it all. You can leave now and, and uh, go outside and smoke and, and uh, we'll, the rest of the lecture is not that much interesting. And when you come back in, you'll be older than when you went out. <laughs> <laughs> So again, TF is a transcription factor and M and methyl binding protein is the protein that blocks the transcription factor from binding. Now there's a lot more to methyl binding proteins than just blocking transcription factors. It may also be a, a protein that helps with nucleosome binding. It may also be a protein that helps with the three-dimensional architecture of the nucleus how DNA attaches itself to the nucleoside skeleton. But we don't have time to go into all that now. So and briefly, DNA methylation silences genes by creating a binding site for methyl binding proteins to attach to the methylated cytosines at promoters. This prevents transcription factors from turning on gene expression. So which DNA bases get uh, met methylated? Only the cytosines do. The adenines, the, the thymidines, the, the guanines don't get uh, methylated. But it's even more specific than that. Specifically, if you notice, in this stylized diagram, there's a number of cytosines here that didn't get methylated. Only specific cytosines do. And the ones that specifically get um, methylated, we'll talk about in just a second. So real briefly, there's three main enzymes that do this methylating. Uh, one is called DNMT1, one is called 3A and 3B. Of course, you're probably asking, where's 2? Well, there is a 2. It's just not as important. And then there's another one that has an L behind it. But the main important ones are DNMT1, 3A, and 3B. Uh, the methyl groups come from the folate cycle, SAM, which activates these genes, okay? And SAH, we talked about that earlier, is the byproduct of DNA methylation, and that inhibits the DNA methylation enzymes by feedback inhibition. So what's the clinical correlation of this? Well, if you don't have enough folate and B12, these deficiencies will prevent normal methylation from occurring. And this is why a lot of mental illnesses are associated with folate and B12 deficiencies, especially things like alcoholism and vegetarians who don't get enough B12 in their, in their diet unless they're supplemented. But I hope that all of you don't think that you can solve this whole methylation problem just by taking some folate and B12, because there's no evidence that taking excess folate and B12 slows down or stops aging. In other words, if you have a deficiency, you need it, but taking mega doses of these vitamins does nothing to stop the meth the, the normal um, epigenetic clock. You agree with that, Steve? Yes. Okay. Um, so how does DNA methylation silence genes? Well, we talked about that earlier, and, and I just showed the transcription factors here, the methyl binding proteins which prevent the transcription factors from binding, okay? So now you know what transcription factors are. We need to briefly talk about promoters, because we did that. A promoter is a sequence in a gene that usually is on the five prime end of the gene. And that's just how DNA is measured as what's the start and the end. And it's, that's the site where the transcription factor has to bind, okay? So most of these sites that have, that can be DNA methylated are located in the promoter area, okay? I should say the promoter area has the richest number of DNA methylation sites. And these are, of course, we talked about methyl binding proteins, and now I want to get to the answering your question, and that is what is a CPG? If you notice on here, I put, if you look at a DNA strand from the five prime to the three prime end, uh, a CPG is where you have a cytosine and a guanine side by side. And now we're gonna talk about that. So what is a CPG? A CPG is a cytosine right next to a guanine and the guanine has to be on the three prime side of it, okay? The other name, uh, uh, CPG, is a cytosine phosphate guanine dinucleotide. So if you hear the word CPT dinucleotide, CPC, or just CPG, 
they're all talking about the same thing. So this is a CPG there, but this is not a CPG. On your right-hand side, this is just a CG base pairing. It's a C from one strand binding to the G on the other strand. So make sure you understand the difference. When we talk about CPG, it's two a dinucleotide on the same strand, not on two opposite strands. Okay. Now, here's what's really amazing. Because of the fact that the C has to be side by side with the G, only about 1 to 1.5% of the entire human genome is made of this dinucleotide sequence. Now, if you work out the numbers, that works out to be somewhere between 20 and 25 million CPG residues. And not all of these are methylated. In fact, when you're born, remember, none of them, excuse me, when the, when the egg is fertilized by the sperm, all the methylation sites are demethylated. And so basically when uh, in a fertilized leg, egg, I believe it's about day five to eight, isn't that right, Steve? The, all the methylation sites are removed. And then during embryogenesis, sites are rapidly added uh, in a program fashion. And that's how an old sperm and an old egg become a young, uh, uh, a young uh, embryo. Now, the interesting thing is that not all these CPGs are, are distributed randomly through the genome. Certain areas of the human genome have a, many more than 1.5% CPGs, such as promoters. Promoters have as much as 18% of their DNA is CPG sites. And, and those areas where CPGs are very rich are called a CPG island. And then there's other areas, such as upstream from the promoter, called the 5' prime UTR, that also can have CPG-rich areas. And then the area that's the most interesting to me is a type of repetitive DNA called alu repeats. Are, are all of you here familiar with that, or you want to spend a mention on that? Alu repeats, to me, is the most fascinating thing, because the only species that have alu repeats are primates. And so all primates share this repetitive sequence of DNA. Now, people who don't really understand biology like to call it junk DNA. <laughs> you can call it that if you want, but there's a role for allo repeats, both during primate evolution, and there's probably a role for it today. But there's about a million of these allo repeats in the human genome. So um, because they are uh, increased uh, show increased CPG enrichment as a term, they probably play a very, very important role both in gene expression and a, a very, very important role probably in nucleosome binding, but we're not going to go into all that tonight. So methylated DNA is silenced DNA. We talked about that. And you can notice once it gets methylated, the nucleosomes now can get closer together, and so now you have compaction of the um, DNA, and that also impedes transcription. So transcription is not just impeded by uh, methylation of a promoter, it's also impeded by DNA compaction, and it's very clear that DNA methylation plays a role in that. And that's why heterochromatin, the type of, of DNA that is not supposed to be copied, is always compacted like this, and DNA methylation is very important. So in summary, DNA methylation at CPG -like sites allow nucleosome binding and DNA compaction. DNA methylation not only silences genes, it silences junk DNA. An example of junk DNA is repetitive elements, uh, pseudogenes and fossil viruses. How many of you are familiar with that? Did you know that you have thousands of fossil viruses in your genome? And we're not talking about you know, latent CMV or Epstein-Barr virus. We're talking about viruses that are no longer uh, functional, they're extinct, uh, but they're still in the human genome and are passed on from generation to generation. And I want to briefly mention the three types of repetitive elements that are important because we're going to talk about these three in a minute, and that is lines, signs, and long terminal repeats. Now we need to talk a little bit about demethylation. So what is demethylation? Well, there's both passive and active DNA methylation. Here's where methyl groups can be removed from the DNA. Um, active demethylation are, is an enzymatic process. Uh, passive demethylation occurs when DNA spontaneously undergoes 
deamination, and then later on gets uh, modified by what's called base excision repair or nucleotide excision repair. Now, the methyl group isn't removed in one step, though. It takes a series of steps to remove this methyl group. So the enzymes that do this have a funny name. They're called 10-11 translocases. And there's three main TET enzymes in humans, TET1, TET2, and TET3. TET1 and TET2 are the ones that get the most attention because they're involved a lot in cancer, and they appear to be very important in the formation of memory in the brain. But TET3 is the one that caught my eye because TET3 appears to be regulated by the glucocorticoid receptor, which, as we know, is a uh, protein that binds to cortisol. And cortisol, of course, is their circadian hormone that gets increased during the day and decreased at night if you go to bed. <laughs> TET enzymes oxidize the methyl groups in three successive steps. And then another enzyme, TGD, removes the oxidized one. So the first step you can see is uh, converting 5-methyl cytosine to 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. So when they first started finding 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine, people just thought this was an oxidative uh, rem uh, side effect of these TET enzymes. But now we know that 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine itself is a epigenetic mark and plays probably a very, very important role in areas where there's active gene expression. In fact, the organ where there's the highest level of hydroxymethyl cytosine is the brain. And it's very clear that there it plays a very, very important role in things like memory and cognition and things like that. TET enzymes are probably the way that non-random, locus-specific age-related demethylation occurs, i.e., the, the half of the clock that Dr. Horvath is going to talk about next. And TET enzymes clearly play a role in aging. They play a role in cancer and disease. But this diagram here is really not a very good diagram. This sort of suggests that uh, this demethylation process is linear. In reality, it's really a circle. So if you look here, I like to call this the full circle of enzymatic CPG methylation and demethylation. So if you notice, you can take a methyl cytosine. It can be oxidized to 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. And with one more oxidation step, 5-4-mil methyl cytosine onto 5-carboxy cytosine. And then it can be completely demethylated back to cytosine and make the, the thing. But if you notice in that diagram, there's a shortcut, too. And that's the, uh, the step in the middle there called base excision repair. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than, than we originally thought. But the bottom line is you can see now how methylation and demethylation can be an ongoing process. And that's why it seemed to be so important in the brain. So what areas of CPGs uh, are methylated in the DNA? And what areas of DNA are, are unmethylated? Well, here's a stylized diagram of a chromosome. And let's start for the far left. How many? If you, um, do any of you know how many methyl groups there are methylation sites that are on telomeres? Any idea? It's a trick question. Don't fall for it. <laughs> That's exactly right. Why? There are no cytosines in um, uh, the, um, the uh, hexamer, the, 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 the six uh, oligo repeat in, in telomeres. So when we talk about DNA methylation, it has nothing to do with telomeres, and that's probably why, as Dr. Horvath pointed out, these are independent uh, phenomena that we see in aging. On the other hand, subtelomeric regions are methylated because those are normal DNA. Centromeres have pericentromeric regions, and as you can see from here, they are heavily methylated. And then there are those repeats that we talked about earlier, line, sign, and long terminal repeats. If you notice there, they're almost all methylated, which means they're supposed to be silenced. Okay? Then a gene itself, if you can see, the gene body may have methyl groups. The C C uh, CPG shore may have some methyl groups. But in most genes, the, the uh, promoter itself has an area that's very rich in CPG sites that's called a CPG island. And not all genes do. Only about 70% of genes have a CPG island in their promoter. But those genes, normally that area is demethylated. 
So real briefly, the types of repetitive DNA, there's lines, that stands for long interspersed nuclear, they have to be silenced by DNA methylation. Signs, those are short interspersed nuclear elements. Example of that is the allo repeat, the primate specific uh, repetitive element. And then long terminal repeats, I don't want to go into all the details in this, but it's another type of repetitive element. So what five changes occur in DNA methylation with aging? Now these are the general changing. There's a, changes. There's a lot more very specific changes, okay? So here's an example of a young person's methylation uh, diagram. And again, this is just a stylized diagram showing different components of, of the genome. And then an elderly person. So if you start on the far left, you can see this is an example of uh, a sign. Is that right? Yes. So that's a type of repetitive element. And if you notice, there's arrows going back, uh, going both ways. That's because in some of these, the, the DNA can be transcribed in, in more than one direction. Those are normally heavily methylated in a young person. But if you notice, most of those sites get demethylated with aging. So sign demethylation is a feature of epigenetic aging. The next diagram, starting from left to right there, you see is a stylized diagram for a CPG-rich gene. That's a gene that has lots of CPG sites in it. Those are normally demethylated when somebody's young, and then with aging, they get hypermethylated. A good example of that would be a tumor suppressor gene that when you're young should be expressed, but when you get old, it gets silenced. The third uh, thing there is lines. Now, you would expect the lines to be just like signs, but they're not. They do undergo some DNA demethylation, but it doesn't seem to correlate with aging like signs do, and it's not exactly clear why. The next one is a CPG poor gene. This is a gene that doesn't have a CPG island, and if you notice there, it undergoes some changes, but not nearly as dramatically as the genes that have a CPG island. And then the last example there is a long terminal repeat, which is another type of repetitive DNA. So real briefly, the five changes that occur with aging is global hypomethylation. Across the board, there's less methylation when you're old versus young. The second is locus-specific CPG hypermethylation. I'm sorry, that's supposed to be hypermethylation, not hypomethylation. And then genes with CPG islands in their promoters undergo silencing. CPG poor genes increase their gene expression. And then repetitive elements, especially signs and long terminal repeats, lose their silencing. And so do the endogenous, the human endogenous retroviruses, those fossil viruses in the human genome. Uh, now remember, these are generalities. There's exceptions to almost all of these. Okay, now how does folic acid B12 and the SAM-SAH ratio affect DNA activity. Well, I want to briefly show you, this is a diagram that basically shows how folic acid and B12 are both needed for what most people call the folate cycle, which of course involves, you know, the methyl tetrahydrofolate enzyme. And then of course that takes homocysteine, converts it into methionine. Methionine then is converted into SAM, and SAM then is the don methyl donor for the DNMT enzymes that now can methylate DNA and then block gene silencing. Now this would be important, say, if you wanted to block repetitive DNA from being uh, expressed, okay? So real briefly, SAM, we talked about this earlier, is a necessary methyl donor, okay? SAH, S-adenosyl homocysteine, is the byproduct of DNA methylation and blocks DNA methylation by feedback inhibition. And the SAM and SAH ratio is actually what determines the activity. It's not the absolute amount of SAM or the absolute amount of SAH. Now, if you look at these four, such, four compounds here, you see there's four enzymes that basically turn that into what we call a cycle. Every cycle has a rate limiting fact, uh, step, uh, an enzyme that limits how fast that cycle goes around. And for the methionine cycle, or this, what I like to call the methylation cycle, the rate limiting enzyme is this enzyme right here. And I didn't spell it out, but that's basically S-adenosyl homocysteine hydrolase. 
So as you notice, that circle has three other enzymes. Those other enzymes are not the rate limiting factor, it's this one. And this is extremely important because we're going to give an example of a drug that is very, very common out there that can affect that enzyme and that's been proven to be uh, a longevity promoting drug. And so I'm going to, uh, so please remember this. This is an enzyme that um, we're going to talk about in just a second that is affected by uh, metformin. So real briefly, SAHH, uh, SAH hydrolase is the rate limiting step for this whole thing. It's not the amount of folic acid or B12, okay? Now, I want to give you some examples of specific things that can make your DNA um, methylation age go faster, things that make the clock tick faster, and things that slow it down. Factors that accelerate epigenetic aging, including folic acid and B12 deficiency, we already talked about that. Smoking and air pollution dramatically affect. Now, I don't remember who it was earlier who was trying to point out that if you had a clock that matched your driver's license birthday perfectly, it wouldn't be that useful because it really wouldn't change with interventions. Um, this is a perfect example. There's now people who are looking at locus-specific sites for DNA methylation that change with smoking. So there may be in the future a DNA methylation smoking clock for smokers. <laughs> And that, of course, would be one where they, you, using elastic net regression, you look for CPG sites that specifically change with that lifestyle intervention. And you could do the same with exercise. You could find a locus-specific clock, in theory, for, for a, a good thing. Um, heavy metals also accelerate the epigenetic clock. Alcohol abuse, malnutrition do. Oxidative stress, and here, of course, we're talking about stress on a cellular level a molecular biology stress. And chronic inflammation also uh, accelerate the clock. Obesity is probably the number one uh, pro health problem in this country right now. And there's some evidence that it's actually going to start to, to decrease the, the rate at, at which uh, people are living longer. Because now obesity has overtaken smoking as the biggest preventable health risk and, and, and health problem in this country. Chemotherapy also dramatically accelerates the epigenetic clock, and so do corticosteroids. There's also factors that slow down the epigenetic aging. Caloric restriction uh, slows it down. So does methionine restriction. Exercise does. Sleep does. Uh, these two compounds are actually natural products found in many uh, fruits and vegetables that are helpful. We'll get to the questions at the end, if you don't mind. Um, the active ingredient in green tea, EGCG, the active ingredient in curry, uh, curcumin, and the active ingredient in soy products also <coughs> slow down the epigenetic clock. Fish oil and vitamin D have also been shown to slow down. And um, we went over some of the molecular mechanism behind this in our blog, but the one I'd like to talk about the most right now is metformin. Metformin has clearly caught the most spotlight in the last few years on its effect on aging. And there's actually very clear evidence that metformin is an epigenetic drug. The, the paper on this was published in April of last year, 2017. And I want to share with you a little bit about this, and this will be the conclusion of my talk. And that is how metformin can slow down the epigenetic aging and increase longevity. I want to uh, preface this by saying for many years, we thought that the mechanism by which metformin worked was its effect on glucose, and, it, and that that was why it was good for diabetics. And then we said, oh, if you lower your glucose, it must make everybody live longer. But there was a paper that came out last year that showed that the longevity effects of metformin were completely independent from glycemic control. So in other words, they're not saying it doesn't work for diabetes. They're just saying its longevity mechanism is a totally different mechanism. I'm going to explain that to you right now. So you already saw this diagram on the right earlier. Okay. So SAHH is a rate-limiting enzyme in what I like to call the methylation cycle, but most people refer to that as the methionine cycle. Okay. Metformin activates this enzyme right here by a very, very circuitous route. If you asked me to guess how it did this, I would have never guessed in my wildest 
dreams of how it did that. And the, the pathway is what they call the AMPK LET7 H19 pathway. And I'm going to show you the data on this. This was not my research, but research that was published in April of last year. And this is the reference on it here. So real briefly, the net effect of metformin is you have less feedback inhibition of the DNMTs due to a lack of buildup of SAH, S adenosyl homocysteine. So how does that exactly work? Well, here's the pathway here. So here's metformin. Metformin, we know, is an AMPK activator. AMPK, when activated, increases LET7. LET7 is a microRNA. LET7 then inhibits H19. H19 is a long non-coding RNA. And H19 then, uh, in, uh, by that going down, you have a, a, dis a decrease in inhibition of SAHH activity. So I know this sounds very, very uh, weird, but I'm going to show you the data here. Okay, so when you treat cells in vitro with metformin, AMPK goes up. No surprise there. That's something we all knew. The next one's a little surprising. LET7 microRNA went up. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with LET7, it's a microRNA that seems to be associated with stem cells, pluripotency, and stemness. So it's a very, very important uh, microRNA, especially in embryogenesis. And then when LET7 levels went up, the long non-coding RNA H19 goes down. So H19 is a long non-coding RNA that is associated with cancer. So this explains, to a certain extent, not only the effects of metformin on DNA methylation, but also explains why studies that they have done of diabetics who are on metformin com compared with diabetics who were not on metformin, that the ones that were on metformin actually had as much as a 30 to 50 percent decrease in cancer mortality. So not only is this important for aging, it's very important for cancer as well. So here's more of the data for this same paper. And so basically you can see that um, they clearly showed the effects of metformin through this pathway that involves a kinase, a microRNA, a long non-coding RNA, and then an enzyme that, uh, that gets rid of S adenosyl uh, homocysteine. I would have never guessed that this was the mechanism by which metformin works. So real briefly, metformin is an FDA-approved drug that could be used off-label as an anti-aging pill. And for those of you who uh, don't know this, there's actually a big push right now by near Barzilai and a, and a number of researchers around the country to do a large trial of 3,000 people with no diabetes to see if metformin increases health span and possibly lifespan. Uh, the study has already been approved by the Ethics Committee. The FDA has already approved it, and nobody wants to fund it. So until, <laughs> and if you have any spare change, please give Near Barzilai a call. I think he needs, is it 30 million or is it 100 million to do it? It's a lot of money. I, I checked, and I don't have that much in my wallet yet. So that's the end of the, uh, my talk. Any questions now? Anything? Yeah. Yes. But then the promoter sites become hypermethylated. Yeah. That's a little paradoxical. Yes. And that's what was so confusing. When I first read Steve's paper, I scratched my head and I got a little bald spot here. I scratched it so much. <laughs> <laughs> because half of his clock is actually DNA CPG sites that lose their methylation as a function of age. And half of them, it's actually not exactly half. Is it 60 40? Okay, do the math. So 193 increase their methylation and 160 decrease. And that's why, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if I had to redo my title slide, I would put locus specific on there because specific sites increase methylation, specific sites decrease. And, you know, and please don't get offended at me, Steve. Steve doesn't have a monopoly or a, a special... Uh, dispensation from God for methylation sites that change. And they, there's many of these out there. He just happened to use a really clever program to find a small group 
that you could use to measure that. But other people have made clocks with other CPG sites, but all the clocks, to my knowledge, have CPG sites that increase their methylation and that decrease. The only one that doesn't is there's one clock that only has three CPGs in it. It's, it's not very accurate, but nevertheless, you know, that's how simple you can make it. So that clock is probably a little bit more like an egg timer, whereas um, Steve's clock is a little bit more like an atomic clock. You know, so. uh, there's a question in the very back. You know, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I have studied homocysteine many, many times. Okay, okay. The question was um, the enzyme SAH, uh, SAHH and its relation to homocysteine. Is that right? Okay. So real briefly, SAHH is an enzyme that converts the precursor to homocysteine into homocysteine. So it's actually an enzyme upstream from homocysteine. The real problem in medicine is that we've been measuring homocysteine for decades now, and we've given people folic acid, and we've gotten their homocysteine levels down, and it doesn't change their disease. I heard that. So yeah. Really that. Well, what I'm saying is, is that we missed the point. See, we should have looked upstream. You know, much like Denham Harmon looked at the byproducts of oxidative stress and thought that it was free radicals the problem. But now we think that aging is far upstream and that the free radicals are the effects of aging, not the cause. So I think most people would say homocysteine is the effect of aging, is the effect of, of inflammation, not the cause of them. And we were trying to treat the effect, not the cause. And when you do that, you don't make a difference in the patient's disease. One more question. Uh, Jim, are there any other promising therapies to turn back the epigenetic clock? I knew, I knew you were going to try to trip me up here. <laughs> no, I gave you a fair warning. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, okay. Um, Johnny, um, I, you're asking a rhetorical question, and the answer to that is absolutely. There's people in this room who are working on solutions to epigenetics. I can't discuss those right now, but I can tell you that I'm extremely excited about the epigenetic interventions. And I would like to take issue, in all due respects, Dr. Horvath, with the statement that the epigenetic clock cannot be reversed. I can tell you that on anecdotal cases, it can be reversed, but we don't have enough data right now to publish. But I do believe, and I will make a bold prediction, that in the next five years, somebody's going to show that an intervention will not just slow down the epigenetic clock, but will reverse it. I don't think it's going to be a magic bullet, because I don't believe that aging is a magic bullet deficiency. Uh, aging is a multifactorial puzzle with maybe 500 pieces, maybe 1,000 pieces, maybe 100,000 people. But there's no question that um, epigenetic aging is a significant part of aging, and it's the best biomarker we have right now. So why don't we run with it, see if we can do epigenetic targeted therapy. And I am very optimistic that there are several things in the pipeline that will reverse the epigenetic clock. I have a question real quick. Uh, is there any evidence for intergenerational changes uh, from diet? Smoking. Um, yes. Um, I, I can tell you that you're saying, let me repeat the question. The question is, is there any evidence for intergenerational changes? That is, ch changes from one generation to the next, right? As opposed to intra-generation changes, which would be smoke, just in me. Well, yes. Yeah. Um, the answer to that is, I think, very important. That is, for a long time, we thought that the only way that information could be passed down from the parents to the children would buy DNA-based pairs, in other words, the DNA sequence. But we now know that epigenetic marking can be passed from generation to generation. And there are three classic examples of that in history. The first was during World War II, when there was an area of Holland where a large number of people underwent a nine-month famine. 
And if you want to look it up, it's called the Dutch hunger famine. And that altered the epigenetic uh, profile of the babies that were in the mother's womb who suffered that, that famine. And they have now documented that the effects of that have been passed on to the children and the children's children. The second effect uh, example in history was uh, in mainland China in the 50s during the Cultural Revolution. And during that time, due to the nationalization in, uh, of the farms and they made the farm collective, there was also a large famine that was not just due to the governmental, uh, um, the, the governmental policies, but also because of a large flood. And there, there were many more people who suffered malnutrition than the Dutch people in World War II. And in the Chinese um, example, not only did they show passing on of epigenetic uh, predisposition to disease from one generation to the next, they, not, they also showed that the epigenetic consequences of that were an increase in mental illness. And that was very, very interesting to me. Both schizophrenia and bipolar illness increased dramatically in the offspring of the mothers who suffered malnutrition. The third example is one that's a little bit completely off base, so I won't go into that. Yeah. If, if babies start, if embryos or babies, let's say start out uh, with zero CPG methylation, yeah. then that um, there must be a complex me mechanism, let's say possibly involving protein methylation that passes on that epigenetic modification to, to, the, to the children at a later age. I think you're right, but you know, the, the bottom line is, in my opinion, that phenomena that the entire genome gets demethylated and then it gets remethylated to be zero ages old, well, actually, zero minus nine, T minus nine months, is the most amazing thing in nature. And I don't think uh, even the, the experts in this field can completely explain what happens between day three and day nine of the embryo, which uh, actually at that point is still a blastocyst. So it's during the blastocyst phase where the entire genome gets demethylated and then gets remethylated. Uh, we know that DNMT1 is involved with that, uh, but I can't tell you much more than that in terms of how it does. Is it involving protein? Of course, DNA methyl transferases are proteins, but exactly how that clock happens, we don't know. Now, we do know the, the driver of that demethylation, remethylation, and that's the Yamanaka factors, the pluripotency factors that um, are responsible for stemness. OX4, SOX, CMYK, KLF, uh, NANOG, you know, those factors. One last question, we'll take a five minute break. But you know, someone asked about cross-referencing DNA methylation with histone modification based markers. And I thought you mentioned something at the very beginning. Yes, about there, there, that's a very good question. The question is, is there any cross-referencing between DNA methylation and histone modification? And the word that I think the scientists like to use is crosstalk. There's a lot of crosstalk between epigenetic DNA methylation and histone uh, epigenetics. And, and it appears in some cases histone modifications affect DNA methylation. Other cases, DNA methylation affect histone modifications. But exactly which is the chicken and the egg is not exactly clear. And what's even more interesting is there's a very evolutionarily old method of epigenetics that isn't really considered to be a separate area called polychrome protein silencing. And that's actually an area that I'm really interested in because polychrome protein silencing is much older than histone-based silencing and probably older than DNA methylation-based silencing. And polychrome protein silencing of genes seems to be very, very linked to the epicenter of cellular senescence. And so I would say that there's more than just histones and DNA methylation. There's also this evolutionarily old system of silencing genes called polychrome protein, um, uh, gr polychrome group uh, based silencing. So there's multiple crosstalks. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered the question. So. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. Mm.
<laughs> okay, everybody, we're going to start, and we're online, so we want uh, everyone to be able to hear our next speaker. Uh, Steve Horvath is a UCLA professor and a pioneer, of course, known for developing the Horvath aging clock, and also for developing weighted correlation network analysis. Now, he's the recipient of uh, research awards, including an Allen Distinguished Investigator Award. And uh, Dr. Horvath has studied genomic biomarkers of aging, uh, the aging process, and many age-related uh, diseases and conditions. And um, tonight, uh, he will describe recent versions of ep epigenetic clocks and their applications. So here's Steve. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Johnny Adams, for organizing this wonderful event, and Bob's, also Bobby, Bobby's, Bobby's, Bobby's work, he did it all, and doc also Dr. Ja from Zymo. Um, thank you for staying so late. Um, I will um, talk about updates on the epigenetic clock. So the original epigenetic clock was published in 2013, and there have been some developments. Um, you've seen this slide before. Um, we keep talking about the aging clock, but what the original um, multi-tissue epigenetic age estimator can do is it can measure age from prenatal samples all the way to centenarian samples. And it can do that in all sources of DNA, all cells and all tissues. And um, so what this clock does is it really links in certain ways development to maintenance during adult life to aging you know this this continuum you know which is really it gives us a profound insight into the nature at least of epigenetic aging so aging um, is it really aging or is it a continuation of development and maintenance you know or conversely does aging happen already very early on in life um, one thing I want to show you are some data from um, Akina Hoshino and T Thomas Ree from the University of Washington, where we applied the um, epigenetic age measure to fetal retina samples. And um, when you carefully look at the x-axis, you see n negative numbers. So this is units of years, so m minus 0.5 years, you know. <laughs> so we're we're talking here about gestational weeks, you know. And in in the retina, we observe correlations of 0.89. It's just striking that the epigenetic clock even applies to these very early um, phases in life. Um, one thing that um, was mentioned is that um, this methylation clock does predict um, lifespan, you know. And I should mention there's a huge error bar, you know. So, so yes, it can say, um, well, you will live another, let's say, 20 years. But um, this association is statistically significant, but there would be a large 95% confidence interval, you know. Why? There are other predictors, um, much more mundane, that are actually much stronger predictors of lifespan. One would be, do you smoke? The, um, smoking status or um, um, your blood pressure, you know. So the epigenetic clock adds to these traditional risk factors, you know, um, but um, don't, yeah, it, it, it tweaks these age estimates a bit and, um, and that is no longer, uh, when I first published the paper in 2013, I just didn't dream that this would be the case, you know, because it's almost too good to be true. But nowadays, there are really half a dozen large-scale studies that have shown that, yes, when, you, when we analyzed um, blood samples collected in the 1990s and we had follow-up information on everybody, how long did they end up living, you know? We knew, or who is still alive? So then, based on the blood methylation data from the 1990s, we could predict how long somebody lived. Um, however, and, and I should say that... Um, it was already mentioned there are several epigenetic clocks, and r pretty much m most of them have that property that they predict lifespan. But um, 
we um, have worked on newer versions of the epigenetic clock that um, are more predictive of lifespan and health span. And this project um, was done by first author Morgan Levine. So we have developed a new clock which we call um, DNA methylation phenotypic age as opposed to chronologic age. That's the idea, you know. It's, it's a, a, in certain ways a better measure of biologic age for this purpose. And it, um, it also uses, again, hundreds of CPGs, in this case 513 CPGs, so more. But um, it, it is quite remarkable what it can do. So this new um, biomarker can, again, predict lifespan due to all-cause mortality. But also it can um, predict what is known as cause-specific death, um, death due to cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, death due to cancer or diabetes or lung dysfunction. So it, um, it, it really covers the whole spectrum of age-related um, uh, mortality and morbidity. But also um, we find that um, this, um, this uh, DNA methylation pheno age um, is um, a predictor of coronary heart disease, that, uh, death due to coronary heart disease, which is quite remarkable because the previous um, version of our, um, the epigenetic clock was not very predictive of coronary heart disease. Um, it also correlates with the coexisting morbidity. So if you go to somebody and count their ailments, that is the morbidity index, and so the phenotypic age in blood correlates with this morbidity index, and also it relates to problems with physical functioning and also interesting cognitive functioning. So um, by now we're used to the successes of the epigenetic biomarkers, but um, three years ago, five years ago, if you had said that a blood measure on the DNA could relate to cognitive functioning, I mean, nobody would have believed it. You would never have gotten funding for that type of study because a, a reviewer would say blood is not relevant for the nervous system. Um, I want to come to accelerated aging diseases, and um, uh, Jim Watson already t talked about it a little bit. So uh, for a while, um, it wasn't clear whether Down syndrome should be considered an accelerated aging condition. And, but there's no doubt the epigenetic clock says that, yes, um, blood samples, brain samples from individuals with Down syndrome are epigenetically older than age-matched controls. So the epigenetic answer is clear. And by the way, Down syndrome is one, is one of the conditions with the strongest pro-aging effect. You know. And also, in more recent work, um, we've worked with um, Anna Meyerhofer and George Martin and Thomas Half and um, Junko Oshimno to analyze um, Werner syndrome. And again, in blood, we found age acceleration um, um, in Werner syndrome individuals. Werner syndrome is known as adult progeria. An, um, so it has an onset in adult people. But there's another progeria, um, an, a, an accelerated aging disease called Hutchinson's Guilford progeria. And this is um, um, a condition that's widely known because it actually affects, unfortunately, children uh, who manifest aging phenotype very early on. And um, many people have looked at I've uh, worked very hard on that problem to see whether I can find accelerated aging effects in Hutchinson's Guilford progeria. And um, I analyzed uh, data, fibroblast data, from the Progeria Research Foundation and when I just applied my original clock, it doesn't find an age acceleration effect in these fibroblasts, you know. But there's a caveat, because if you ask me in what cell type does my um, clock not work well, I would probably start with fibroblasts. I mean, it kind of works, but um, you've seen these beautiful correlations of 0.95, you know. And, and we observe correlations of 0.9 and more in pretty much all cell types and tissues, but f not in fibroblasts, okay? There the correlation is maybe 0 0.6, 0 0.7, you know. 
So then I've been thinking, well, maybe my original clock is deficient, so build a new clock. And so I, I've just, um, over the holidays, developed a new epigenetic clock, which I don't have a good name for, but I call it the epigenetic clock for skin and blood cells. And um, it really applies, as the name says, to cells in the skin, certainly fibroblasts, keratinocytes. It also applies to endothelial cells, but it also is phenomenally accurate in blood cells, but many other cells and tissues. However, its raison d'etre is, is really to facilitate these in vitro studies, you know, because um, like many of you, I'm trying to find anti-aging interventions. And so what we have in mind is um, having a dish with some cell cultures, you know, it could be fibroblasts, keratinocytes, endothelial cells, and then we try different anti-aging compounds. And my close collaborator, Ken Raj, has already uh, tried several compounds, and some of them have striking effects on um, these fibroblasts. So coming back to Hutchinson's Guilford progeria, so I, I now applied also the new epigenetic clock to these fibroblast samples from the Progeria Research Foundation. And you know, no matter how I analyze the data, I don't see an effect. So the right panel shows how this methylation age relates to chronologic age and the colors indicate disease status. So red is classic and classical Hutchinson skillful progeria and uh, green non-classical and uh, we really don't see a difference. So this is in certain ways perplexing, but basically HGP according to the epigenetic clock and in fibroblasts, there's no age acceleration. Could be in other tissues, you know, who knows. Um, I now want to come to another topic. Um, there are, of course, several methylation-based biomarkers of aging. I, I talked about the multi-tissue methylation age estimator. Um, Hanum and uh, from the lab of Eidecker and Kang Zhang developed another age estimator for blood, but it also works in other tissues. I mentioned the most recent version of the pheno age estimator, then the skin and blood estimator. Um, I've worked um, with Michael Kobo's lab and Lisa McEwen on a new, what we call a pediatric buccal clock, so it's very accurate based on buccal epithelial cells. Um, and others mentioned the clocks by Widener and Wagner. And so there are many clocks, and I just give you a, a comparison, you know, because um, here I um, show you how these eight different clocks perform in children. Why? Because that's where clocks break down. You know, many clocks work quite well in adults, but um, if you're interested in development, children matter, you know. So these are children aged between 2 and uh, 12. And you see my original clock in panel A, upper left panel, is very accurate. And so is my new clock, the skin and blood clock in panel D, the right clock. Um, however, some of the other clocks that are mentioned um, are less accurate. You know. Why? Because they were built in adults. Um, now here I compare these eight different biomarkers in brain samples. So these are now brain samples from adults from 18 to actually 114. So they were brain samples collected from uh, Steve Coles and the GRG to their credit and uh, we analyzed them. And here again, the original uh, multi-tissue clock um, in panel A works very well, very high correlation of 0.93. And the other clocks are, st uh, are less accurate in brain. Um, when you look at the dots, you see some r red dots, and um, it's not quite clear uh, maybe on the screen, but um, these are cerebella samples, you know? And so it turns out that um, all epigenetic clocks underestimate the age of the cerebellum. And you can interpret that as a flaw of the clocks, or you can interpret this as a bi biologic finding. Because um, the cerebellar samples, in my worldview, the cerebellum is the part in the back of your brain. Um, this part of the brain simply ages more slowly. That's my interpretation. And so I want to remind you, uh, Steve Coles was the senior author on a study where we showed that, yes, the cerebellum ages slowly according to the epigenetic clock. And this figure was all created with um, 
centenarians and supercentenarians collected by Steve Coles uh, and the members of the GRG. Um, so this is the brain of a 114-year-old person. Um, the upper panel shows you um, the ages, estimates from 30 different parts of the human body. And um, this, uh, and again, on the leftmost, you see the cerebellum has the youngest age, you know. And um, yes, yes, it's all post-mortem. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we can learn a lot from centenarian studies. I feel, for example, which organ age faster and not. And for these studies where you compare aging rates of different organs, you really need this multi-tissue age estimator, you know. Whereas when you have a blood-based age estimator, there are certain biases, and these analyses are um, conceptually more difficult to carry out. Um, here I show you a comparison of um, three of the widely used epigenetic um, markers, um, the multi-tissue predictor and also the predictor from Hanum and from 2013. And I have all sorts of criteria. Um, you see accuracy for estimating age in children, accuracy of age estimating age in brain regions, um, correlation with gestational age, um, um, homogeneity of the estimates across different tissues from a supercentenarian, um, whether it relates to offspring status of a centenarian, <laughs> cognitive functioning in the cortex, neuritic plaques, and so on. And uh, on these metrics I just mentioned, the multi-tissue predictor, um, age estimator, really works very well and outperforms the other me measures. However, when it comes to another outcome that we care about a lot, which is predicting time to death, um, we see that actually the Hannum predictor, in colored in red, um, it's one of these um, um, panels, it works well um, compared to the original multi-tissue predictor. However, the phenotypic age estimator, this novel biomarker we developed, it actually outperforms all other age estimators, and by a lot. It's substantially more accurate for predicting lifespan, as I mentioned. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the biology. This radar plot also depicts how these different clocks relate to um, leukocyte telomere length. And you see that the phenotypic measure that works so well at predicting lifespan actually does um, have a stronger association with telomere length than, for example, Hanum, and the original multi-tissue estimator really doesn't have any relationship to telomere length. And a similar story can be said about naive T cells and, and other blood cell markers. So these um, some age estimators that were mainly built, that were, no, were built based on blood methylation data, they tend to be confounded by changes in blood cell composition and leukocyte telomere length, that all makes sense, and it may even be desirable for certain applications, you know. Why? Because it measures immunosenescence, you know. However, the multi-tissue predictor is really separate from that uh, part of biology. Um, moving on, I briefly mention our work on epigenetic aging clocks in mammals. So, um, I, I want to develop epigenetic clocks for 50 different mammals, and um, this is a an, an project funded by um, Paul G. Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, and um, um, he has uh, made a grant available so that we will profile tissues from 50 different mammals, uh, any, every mammal we can get a hold of, you know, from horses, rabbits, pigs, cats, um, but um, anything. Why? So we believe that, um, of course, animals will be very valuable for preclinical studies. Many people focus on mice, but nothing wrong with studying other animals as well. And um, now there are already epigenetic aging clocks for these different animals. So. Um, Matteo Pellegrini and uh, Mike Thompson uh, um, uh, developed a clock for dogs. 
Another group uh, developed by Jarman and uh, Polanowski, uh, an epigenetic age estimator for humpback whales. And there are three or four papers that describe epigenetic age estimators for mice. And you heard earlier, Zymo also um, has a version of a mouse clock. Now, these, all of these publications, um, which are wonderful um, because they so much advanced our field, because they sh did show that gold standard anti-aging interventions really reverse epigenetic aging. So they, for example, calorie restriction or rapamycin or a growth receptor knockouts, um, these um, interventions did affect the epigenetic age of um, these mice. Briefly mentioned, these are groups by Wolf Reek, um, Vadim Gladyshev, Trey Eidecker, Tina Wang, Peter Adams. They, they've shown that these gold standard that interventions reverse aging, which is a great um, insight. However, there are challenges. And this is that all of these publications were ba based on a particular way of measuring methylation called reduced representation bisulfide sequencing. And it's the truth, and my lab also used it with Matteo Pellegrini. We have generated these data. And the truth is, it's been very difficult to compare these clocks across data sets. And why? Because these clocks often measure different locations in the genome. We heard earlier, a human has 28 million CPGs. So this technology may lead to high quality data in 100,000 loci. And then a month later, you repeat the experiment, you get another 100,000 loci, and there's no overlap. And so one solution to this problem is really to then develop a custom methylation array. And, and um, in order to develop a clock that will work in many species, you want to focus on loci that are highly conserved across all 50 mammalian species. So. I've had the pleasure with working with uh, Professor Jason Ernst at UCLA and his doctoral student, Adriana Spurley, and Illumina, and we develop what we call a mammalian methylation array. And this array will profile 40,000 highly conserved sites in the genome. It will be applicable to all of these animals. You can, if you happen to study white rhinoceroses, your, your research problems have been solved, okay? <laughs> <laughs> or the micro bat, you know? So we can, um, we can measure uh, methylation in all of these animals. And um, um, the coverage is not great. This is, uh, you get 20,000 CPGs here and 20,000 there, you know? However, it will be enough for measuring the ages in these animals. That, that it can do, you know. It just isn't a genome-wide study. So are 40,000 um, conserved CPGs enough for estimating age accurately? The answer is yes. We, we've done a feasibility study with Michael Thompson has led that. So even using as few as uh, 3,000 highly conserved CPGs, you can build very accurate age estimators in mice. Why study 50 different animals? Um, we really need it for modern phylogenetic comparative approaches. We want to know why does, a, uh, why does a mouse live three years and why does a bat live 30 years, although they have similar sizes, you know. So um, to do this phylogenetic comparative biology um, 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 studies, you need large sample sizes. I want to briefly talk about telomere length. Um, it's been mentioned several times that, um, yes, uh, methylation age is much more correlated with um, chronologic age. The upper panel shows you how telomere length relates to chronologic age, and you see a big cloud, and the lower panel shows you on the very same individuals from the Framingham Heart Study do we observe much tighter correlations. You know. Um, but a more careful analysis really shows that epigenetic age acceleration, certainly of the multi-tissue clock, is not correlated with telomere length. And we know that from many very large cohort studies, thousands and thousands of people. Um, however, um, Ake Lu, who um, sits in the audience over here, and she can tell you all about it, so she did um, a genetic analysis of epigenetic aging rates in blood. 
because uh, just to tell you, um, one reason why some people age faster than others is genetics. There's no question. It's 40% of the variability in the ticking rate of the clock is genetic. So the question is, so what are the genes, you know? And so one of the loci that came out is very familiar to most of you. It's the telomerase locus, you know? <laughs> and that is just mind-boggling, because if we had done a genome-wide study of telomere length, you would have found this locus. How do I know? Because the right panel shows the same graph for a genetic study of telomere length, you know? So you found telomerase. But the point is, we did the same with the multi-tissue epigenetic clock. We found the same locus, you know? Mind-boggling. Why is it? Um, so this was utterly surprising to me. Why? Because it was um, a study of epigenetic aging, not telomere length. But there's another reason um, why it was so surprising, which is that the associations were so unexpected. Because imagine you um, inherit genetic variants that are um, associated with active telomerase. These very same variants that in certain ways are beneficial for telomere length, these very same variants actually are detrimental for the epigenetic age, meaning they are associated with slower, uh, sorry, with uh, faster epigenetic aging, okay? It was a paradoxical association. So um, just to caution everyone, we don't claim that longer telomeres are associated with older epigenetic age, because I told you earlier, there is no relationship between telomere length and epigenetic aging. But there's this, what people call pleiotropic effect of this locus, the telomerase locus, the tert locus, to be much more precise. Telomerase is an enzyme with several components, so the, the tert locus is associated, not the uh, TERC. And here I want to show you um, some in vitro studies from um, in fibroblasts, again carried out by Ken Raj, where um, you, the red bars show you immortalized fibroblasts. They over um, H tert is expressed immortalized, and the y-axis shows you the epigenetic age. And what do you see? That with cell passaging, the epigenetic age continues to go up. So this is amazing because even immortalized fibroblasts continue to age according to the epigenetic clock. Again, highlighting that these are different phenomena. Um, Want to come to one um, study by Friedrich Stolzel and Martin Bornhäuser and a German team who evaluated um, what happens if you um, carry out a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So um, unfortunately, some people who um, develop a certain type of leukemia, um, the AML leukemia, need to get their entire blood replaced. You know? So you uh, re um, then implant these um, stem cells. And the question is, imagine you're 50 year old and you get the stem cell transplant from a 20-year-old. And then you, three years later, what is the age of your blood, you know? And the study is very clear on that, um, without boring you, but it's all about the age of the donor. The 50-year-old with a transplant from a 20-year-old, his blood will be the age of the donor, meaning about 20-something, you know? Um, however, of course, graft versus host disease um, then accelerates aging, you know. So th this is, of course, a very um, dangerous uh, transplantation procedure, has a lot of risks. But in principle, it's quite remarkable that even long term, if we followed this person, the 50-year-old who got the blood of a 20-year-old, and we followed them for him for 30 years, okay, <laughs> And the question is, would ever the, in, the rest of the body reset the age of the blood? And the answer is never. It never happens. The blood will always have the age of the donor. You know. It tells you a lot about the biology of the um, clock. Many people talked about these lifestyle interventions. Um, everything that's known to be good for you, vegetable, fruits, exercise, it all has a beneficial effect according to the epigenetic clock, but I tell you the effects are very small. You need thousands of people to detect it. 
And so clearly what, what we want, of course, are small molecules and other therapies that have a much stronger effect on epigenetic age. And um, I'll stop with acknowledging um, the many people. I think I mentioned most of them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, one one uh, genetic uh, change, or you mentioned the H. Turk locus kind of uh, being associated with change, uh, with differences in epigenetic aging. Yes. Somebody's asking about the biological significance of the genes that are found. Uh, you know, I, and I know there's maybe a little bit of data about which genes are overexpressed or underexpressed uh, mm -hmm. due to the you know, those different CPG sites. Is there? Yeah, you know, it's that's a good question. More, more generally, what's the relationship between methylation and gene expression, you know? And that's really a question that, in certain ways, um, plagues the entire field of me epigenetics, you know? We all have that question, you know? <laughs> there are some locations where you do see a relationship, but in most locations, there's no relationship, you know? And... Um, and and it's paradoxical. Um, however, um, um, the people think that this effect could uh, could be not um, the methylation might not relate to gene expression um, right next to the CPG, but perhaps um, in further away. You know, that's one um, line of thinking. You know, and. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, um, I invite you, of course, to read um, the paper from R.K. Lu about this genetic study. It, it will come out in uh, Nature Communications in a couple of months or a couple of weeks, I don't know. It's in the production phase. Um, there's already an article on bioarchive, so you can, um, R.K. spent months, if not years, to carefully <laughs> studying which genes are implicated, but just to warn you, it's difficult, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's a group, I think it's uh, in Texas, that's looking at the telomere position effect over long distances, where they're looking at a loop of the chromosome on, a uh, loop of the telomere on chromosome 5, uh, looping back to the h turt site. And they have fairly good data that nobody else yet has replicated, but that telomere loop uh, actually uh, re is, explains why telomerase gets reactivated when the telomere gets too short. And it probably has to do with CPG methylation and methyl binding proteins attaching to the shelterin proteins. Uh, any comment on, on whether you think we may find more of these long distance uh, effects of a methyl binding site? Yeah, um, James made a, uh, Watson made a wonderful comment that um, telomeres loop back and that might um, activate telomerase and uh, more generally long distance effects, you know. I mean, I certainly hope that people carefully look at it, you know, because um, this has stymied the whole field, you know, how um, the um, methylation or more generally even um, epigenetic changes affect expression. Th clearly, expression affects epigenetics. It's actually a two-way street. It clearly warrants detailed mechanistic studies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll start. Yeah. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. I think yeah. you made a tremendous contribution. Uh, I, I Thank would you. say that as somebody who focused a lot on telomeres, yes. I have to say that um, the HG Hutchinson Guildford was very interesting. And, and when I look at telomere lengths, especially, um, I like to think of it in terms of if you keep the telomerase active, then the telomeres not only get longer, but you have acquisition of other gene mutations, right? That's so right. So the actual ability for stem cell-like cells to persist allows them to age in epigenetic terms, but their lineage doesn't die out. So part of the act of staying young is actually, as we see with the senolytic research, Part of staying young is killing off these cells, so it's a double-edged sword. When you increase the survivability yes. of stem cell lineages, then they accrue different exactly. So exactly. I mean, clearly, uh, people who fight aging at some point you need to maintain telomeres. However, what what these studies show that's not enough, you know, because there are other things that continue to accrue, you know, and. Uh, 
Um, people have done a lot of research. I mean, what we've shown here, the epigenetic aging continues to go on, unfortunately, you know, so I'm with you. It, it may serve a purpose. See, in my opinion, uh, telomere shortening, you know, is clearly an anti-cancer mechanism, you know, um, but epigenetic aging could have a complementary role, you know, so even, in other words, if the, a cell is immortalized, then maybe these methylation changes serve the purpose to prevent further instability, you know, and... Well, uh, I mean, yeah. as I understand yeah. the presentations that we've heard, the three amazing presentations, mm -hmm. at no point are you saying that you're trying to understand the grammar or the actual meaning of gene expression. What I, I see is your data mining to find things that are highly correlative in a bi-directional way with measured age. Yes. You're not making any interpretation as to what the grammar, the meaning of, or the, the stepwise mm -hmm. expression of these lineages is. Because you're really just measuring yeah. differentiation of cells, mm -hmm. and then you're assuming there's some hidden clock, whether it be how many cortisol squirts you've gotten, but you're not inferring any kind of mechanism here. In the well, I, would, I wouldn't put it this way. I would say the first step was to develop the most accurate biomark, molecular biomarker that's out there. That was step one. But clearly that's not enough, right? <laughs> we, um, we need to go much deeper to really understand, I call it the clockwork, the molecular clockwork. Um, there are many thoughts. It could be circadian rhythm. It could be metabolic changes. You know, it, um, um, the genetic studies shed some light, but uh, again, only the beginning. I think this is really the price to understand the biology. You know, um, you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So DNA repair. Um, does have a relation to methylation or question m m in different ways, you know. Um, my original paper from 2013 showed things like p53 mutations um, are associated with um, um, changes in epigenetic aging, you know. So there are certain indirect lines that um, sensors of DNA damage might be related, you know. But um, the, but um, radiation treatment of cells, you know, which induces strong DNA damage, actually was, has not been found to be associated with um, increased methylation age, you know. So there's no easy um, connection. There's indirect evidence there might be, but who knows? Yeah, yeah okay, James. Yeah. I know that yeah. a lot of your um, data mm -hmm. uh, acquisition or the training sets were based on the Women's Health Initiative. And you know, the, the big controversy from the Women's Health Initiative was the effect of hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women. Yes. And that, you know, the data from that has been used as a, a club or a, uh, a sledgehammer to um, alter uh, practice patterns in medicine. Yes. So my question for you is, um, based on your data from uh, the Women's Health Initiative, using either the multi-tissue or your, your new uh, phenotype clock, do you believe that hormone replacement therapy, specifically in postmenopausal women, accelerates uh, epigenetic aging? Uh, does it have no effect or does it deaccelerate? Yeah. So the question is whether menopausal hormone replacement therapy has an effect on epigenetic aging, especially in the Women's Health Initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, the answer is complex. So first of all, in blood, we've never seen an effect. However, in other tissues we have. Um, buccal epithelium, you know. So we have shown that women who uh, take hormone replacement, actually their buccal, the inside of their mouth, the buccal cells are younger, you know, than women who don't take that therapy. So I think um, probably a lot of anti-aging interventions will have an organ specific effect you know things might affect blood but not liver or vice versa you know um, similar obesity has a little bit of an aging effect in blood no question um, a little bit but in liver it has a huge effect you know um, but more generally about hormone treatment i think this is clearly a, an exciting frontier like if that i 
um, a lot of the data I look at implicate hormones in one way or another. And I wish somebody w really investigated that in a very systematic way. Um, large number of people, different regiments of hormones, different sources of DNA, buccal cells. Mm -hmm. Why buccal cells? Because they have estrogen receptors, whereas blood cells have fewer estrogen receptors, you know. Mm -hmm. So some organs are more um, susceptible. You know? Yes. I mean, yes, I've sent out lots of emails on that topic. <laughs> I, uh, the question is testosterone treatment in men. Absolutely. I would love to study it, you know. I mean, there are clinical trials going on right now, and um, my phone is always there. If somebody calls me up, I would love to analyze it. Absolutely. But not just testosterone, growth hormone, you know, and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alexei Alovnikov is the guy who proposed the existence of telomerase. Yeah. And uh, his new theory is that although telomere telomeres are important for cell aging, he postulates that there's a hypothalamic clock and like a gravitometer that tells you how many moons you've lived, mm -hmm. which is really out there. But I mean, there are organs that we don't know about, like the saccule, yes. the organ we have for ultrasound. So yes. if he's right, could you take some of the hypothalamic neurons and do a, a specific measurement as to the correlation between, like a 20-year-old guy mm -hmm. dies in a motorcycle accident, or you know, a, a fetus is terminated 18 weeks. Yes. Maybe look at the hypothalamus might be where- I agree. Body. There's several the very- yeah. I mean, uh, several people, very smart aging researchers, have voiced that idea, study the relationship between the hypothalamus or function or yeah. various measures and, um, and aging in general, but epigenetic aging, yeah, absolutely. The yes. Yeah, I mean, probably um, the best way to do it is in animal models, right? So somehow to manipulate it, to see it in time courses and, and, and it really... So these are probably the most rigorous studies. And, and the good thing is we, um, we, there are already epigenetic clocks for m mice and other animals, but I can promise you in, in a couple of months we will have super accurate measures of epigenetic age in animals, you know, and then we can do it. Good idea. Okay, yes, Greg? Yeah. Speaking of, excuse me, the hypothalamus, yeah. Very exciting paper that came out around August of last year from Kai's lab. Um, he's been looking at the role of the hypothalamus in programming aging. And what he found is that a lot of that is mediated through uh, um, neural stem cells in the brain, mm -hmm. but the, their effects are mediated by exosomes. Yes. So I'm wondering have you considered isolating exosomes from blood and running your clock on those to see if that might be a stronger? Uh, indicate what's going on in blood in general. Yes, I mean, um, th th this was a very exciting paper, and absolutely. I mean, I think it could easily be exosomes, or um, James Watson always likes non coding RNAs. It's totally on my radar screen, you know, <laughs> uh, on many other people, because in certain situations, these non coding RNAs have a strong relationship to methylation, especially at certain loci, you know. Absolutely, it could very much be that. Um, at some point, we looked at um, microRNAs. I remember in plasma, didn't find anything, but yeah. Who knows? Maybe one day somebody generates the data and then there's the low hanging fruits. I know that certain exosomes uh, really coordinate the ticking of the clock. You know? I, very plausible. Problem is, many of us, we have already voiced lots of good theories, you know. <laughs> I mean, and we just need uh, data. Is, is it hormones? Is it, um, you know, circadian? Is it hypothalamus? You know, so many things, you know. <laughs> so more yeah. at the cellular yeah. level, somebody asked yeah. about, you know, is, is there anything, you know, has anybody upregulated demethylation and just watched what happened? And I guess maybe it's related to, like, the epigenetic age of a cell. There are things like... Uh, reprogramming that yes. obviously affect the epigenetic age. So yes. What happens when you tweak all the different pathways that Dr. Watson was talking about? Yeah, so um, I, with my UCLA colleague William Yang, we will actually study 
all these components that were mentioned in mice. So these are conditional, uh, so sorry, these are uh, knockouts, heterozygous knockouts. What happens if you knock out one of the DNMTs, uh, and there are many in mice? Um, what about if you knock out TET, you know? So, and definitely we'll study that, you know. There are already some people who have data on that, but I'm just saying that's what we will do in a few months, you know. But right now, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, Greg? Yeah. Yeah. The discordance between the positive effective telomer length uh, on the one hand and, and, it, and the negative epigenetic signature of that, yes. do you have any insight as to what causes that discordance? Are there specific sites that you can point to that yeah, I think, that? well, let me start by saying that it's actually not only at the third locus, okay? So um, these ge genetic studies have actually found many telomere maintenance genes, you know? And so um, Ake has looked at several of them, whether she sees the same paradoxical associations. In other words, a genetic variant that is good for telomere maintenance is that genetic variant then associated with increased methylation age, you know? And although the findings are much less significant than at TERT, the same trend holds at multiple loci, you know. So there is, this fin there is something about, th it seems that things that, that are good at maintaining telomeres, <laughs> whatever is good for that is associated with older epigenetic aging. And, and um, now, why is that? One way to interpret these results, um, and Ken Raj has formulated that, is well, if, some, if you have a cell that simply lives longer, why? Because telomerase is um, active, you know? So it just lives longer. Well, then this cell has longer time for accumulating methylation changes, do you see? And therefore, it makes sense that something that lives longer will have a longer epigenetic age, you know? On that level, one could ex interpret that. You know? That's one in interpretation. Um, another is that at some point, I postulated that the epigenetic clock relates to a, what I called the epigenomic maintenance system. You know, that there's this maintenance system that plays a purposeful role. And another way to interpret these findings is that, well, whatever maintains telomeres is part of this more general machinery of maintaining the epigenome. You know. But yeah, but you had a thought. <laughs> yeah. I've lost. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we we lost that. Other questions? Well, thank you, everyone, for your patience. Sure, sure. Yeah, we owe special thanks to Bobby Brook. He's the one who made this happen tonight for all of us here in this room and at home and those of you watching the recording later. So please, everybody, big round of applause for Bobby. And also for our speakers, Steve, Jim, Keith, uh, all the time that it, it takes you not only to learn this stuff, but to put together outstanding presentations. Everybody, please. Now, we have learned the clock is ticking, people. So I hope all of this tonight is going to motivate you to take action, to develop new therapies to turn back this epigenetic clock for lots more years of healthy living. So that's all. Thank you.